When I was a teenager, my family moved into a large Victorian-style house in Beaver, Pennsylvania. If you've never heard of it, I'm not surprised. Quaint little historical township with a population of less than 5,000. Our family moved there specifically for my mom's work with the Beaver Area Heritage Foundation. At the time, it was one of the few jobs where she could build her own hours, split time between working from home and occasionally going into work for board meetings or something specific. This sort of meant everything to my mom at the time. My little sister was just three and not yet in school, and she always hated that she had to work nonstop at the historical museum when I was growing up. But that's just where they were at the time, my parents and their money. But now, she had this opportunity. So, the house. In 2010-ish, my mom was perusing the internet looking at various houses in the Beaver area. She landed on something relatively close to the super historical district. I caught a glimpse of this beauty on my mom's computer and practically squealed in excitement while asking if that's where we were going to live. She was enthusiastic, saying she and my dad were going to look at it that afternoon. Unfortunately, I'd be at school, so it was a no-go for me. I told my mom that she better buy that beautiful house. The next time we spoke, that's exactly what happened. From the outside, from the photos, I'll admit, the home was incredibly dreamy. It was, and still is, the biggest place I've ever lived in. But I was a bit thrown off living directly across the street from a history museum. I guess there were worse things to look at, I reasoned. But for me, the dream factor wore off relatively quickly. It should have been great, and sometimes, especially towards the end of my time there, it was. But not always. And those times made it hard to imagine anything would be normal in that house. Cut to the moment where we all see the home together. I was impressed. It held up to my expectations from the outside. But the moment we crossed the threshold from outside to inside, I wondered why it felt so dark. Part of me was expecting to see beautifully painted walls or ones filled with colorful wallpaper. It was clear the photos had slightly exaggerated or had somehow let in a lot more light. The whole ride here, my mom was beaming, totally excited, especially to show my sister and I the house and our rooms. So, I tried to be happy and excited, anything but a bratty teen at that moment. But I guess I failed since my mom asked me, What's wrong? You don't like this beautiful home? Well, just wait till you see your room. She smiled and I returned the smile. I picked up my little sister and excitedly told her that we were going to go see our rooms. Immediately, I could tell which room my mom wanted for me, the one that I wanted for me. Large bay window, tall white wooden shutters, rose-colored wallpaper, and a gold accent wall. I was already envisioning what it could look like with my special touch. Thankfully, I didn't feel this dark feeling in my room. I chalked up the initial feeling to just being naive, thinking that a home would look exactly like highly edited photos online, ones taken in a way that make the home look exactly like a dream. The house was fine, I concluded. Satisfied, I took my little sister to her room. It was much smaller and sat right next to mine. My sister couldn't care less about going into her room. She preferred to stay in my room. I walked into her room, and again, the moment I crossed the threshold into that room, I felt this dark, palpable heaviness. She also had rose-colored walls, a large window letting in lots of light, but I didn't like that despite all of this, it felt shady. But as a teenager, I dismissed that feeling pretty quickly and went back to my room, But it wasn't long after moving in that my little sister was running to my room, crying, struggling to breathe, shaking me awake. It was the dead of night. I could barely see her face, but I could hear her, and I instantly grabbed her into the bed and asked her what was wrong. She told me someone's in her room. I maybe should have been alarmed, but I wasn't at first. 
I made her calm down. I asked her to tell me about her dream. But she swore it wasn't a nightmare. She cried that she was sleeping, but he woke her up. Suddenly, it dawns on me that we are in a new house, and it's entirely possible someone's in her room. I grabbed my sister and quietly ran to my parents' room to wake them up. I was talking in almost a whisper as I told my parents what was going on. Now, we were all freaked out, but my dad grabs his gun and tells us to stay inside the room. While my mom's hugging my sister, she says quietly that she doesn't think daddy's gun is going to help. That's when we learned that the man in my sister's room was really a large, dark shadow of a man. Describing him, she said he was see-through. I looked at my mom like, right, bad dream. My dad comes back in the room soon after and declares that no one's in the room, or any of the rooms for that matter. All the doors and windows are locked. So we all put my sister back to bed, my bed for the record, and then I was silently blamed in the hallway for exposing my sister to scary movies, causing her to have nightmares. For a moment, I decided that I was going to sleep in my sister's bedroom. If she was going to take my room, I was going to take hers. And that's when I remembered the feeling. Not before, but as soon as I crossed that threshold. Heaviness. I instantly felt for my little sister. Sure, there was no shadow people in here. But why did it feel so weird in this room? Surely she had to feel that too. And my parents? I don't know. But I went back to my room and I slept through the night. However, that sleeping through the night thing would become rare. I'd end up switching rooms with my little sister. Well, almost. I didn't want to. She was clearly so disturbed, though. And spending more time in my bedroom anyway, it just made sense. My parents incentivized the deal by giving me permission to drive their car on the weekends. But after seeing how excited my sister was to move rooms, I was practically sold anyway. But I allowed them to bribe me. During the move, my dad said that he kept hearing something interesting. Then, my mom, too. Scratching noises all throughout the room. My dad says that he needs to work on eliminating any possible pests before they make the move. At first, I was so confused. Like, what kinds of pests? Rats? Bugs? Maybe it's just the sound of you moving around. I don't want to move into an infested room, though. Then he tells me that he's heard these in the walls before. While he was installing my sister's bed, when we moved in, he thought he'd heard scratching in the walls. He searched around, but he didn't find any sign of actual pests. No feces, nothing suspicious in the basement or the attic. But he tells me that he never officially checked the walls, and that it could be something messing with the electrical in that room. Over the next few months, things got strange. I was back to sharing a room with my little sister, but that wasn't the strange part. My dad had various people in and out for the inspections, and eventually he decided that he wanted to replace the drywall in that room. He was still hearing the scratching, my mom too. So construction on my new room started, and during that time, things got even worse. Even the nights where we weren't talking about experiencing things, we all were. Now what my parents heard was scratching. I heard whispering. There were multiple nights when I would be awake, assuming that I was the last one up in the house. But then I'd hear this whispering coming from the other side of the wall. I would press my ear against the wall just to confirm what I was hearing. I'd be so sure that it was my parents having some sort of hushed discussion, so I'd get up and I'd go to my new room, figure out what they're saying. But they wouldn't be there. I'd walk into the room and hear absolutely nothing, and see absolutely nothing. Then I'd walk to my parents' bedroom door. I'd place my ear against their door. Silence. This happened multiple times but I started to realize it only happened after 12 a.m., so for the first time in my life, I developed a bedtime. At 10 o'clock every night, I would will myself to sleep. This worked for a minute, maybe a week or even two weeks, but eventually it started again. I'd 
find myself drawn to that room a lot over this period of time. Basically, I wasn't sleeping. My sister, however, seemed to be sleeping like a baby. Then, about a month, maybe less, into the deconstruction of that room, the contractors find something in the walls. Bones. Bird bones. Squirrel bones. Snake skins. The whole lot. But naturally, the most unsettling thing they found, and why they ultimately had to stop construction, were the human remains. Over the next several weeks, the scene had to be preserved, and it was recommended that we stay in a hotel, so that's what we did. We crammed into a hotel while crews worked to remove the remains from our house. My mom was technically thrilled because she thought that she might get wind of the situation, given her job. Possibly they were the remains of a historical figure. She was partially right. She was involved in the process months later of having the skull donated to the Mutter Museum in Philadelphia, which is known for its extensive collection of medical oddities, including a collection of over 130 human skulls. So at the time, and maybe to this day, the remains were not officially identified. But they are, to the best of my knowledge, all being preserved, in addition to the skull at the museum. Also, my parents do in fact still own this house. It did in fact not sit well with me at first, but I continued to grow up there, and so did my little sister, for much longer. But we didn't have any of those experiences, no more oddities in the house. So, who knows, maybe our house was haunted for a minute. Maybe it was infested by animals that got scared away, or maybe it was all in our heads. But you can't deny the bones. Basically, anyone you tell this story to is going to come up with their own theories anyway. So, thanks for reading. I'll try to keep it to the point and not drift off too much, but I swear on everything this is a true story of my own experience. When I was 12 or 13, I was living with my aunt for a few years and my younger cousin... We lived in a little house on a dead-end road in a small town of about 500 people. We were technically considered a village. My aunt was an odd soul. Everyone has their own rhythm, and hers was a different rhythm for sure. She had a fascination with the odd and the strange, from a musical, dancing, miniature, jester figurine to old newspapers from the 20s. Then enter her collection of porcelain masks, of which she had more than thirty. All different sizes and styles, and she had them all over her bedroom walls. The house we lived in was small but cozy, but this house had other paranormal events happen in it, before and after the events of this story. So it was no big deal when small stuff would happen, because we were odd like that. Some stuff being harmless was fine by us. None of what happened before or after was harmful. This is the only event I was ever actually stricken with pure fear. It was my 13th birthday, and for my birthday, I wanted us all to watch a horror movie together, because those were my favorite and still are to this day. We watched A Haunting in Connecticut as the chosen movie. It was my aunt and uncle, their three kids, my two friends, and myself there to watch it. After the movie, we all just kind of crashed, so I went to my aunt's room to sleep because it was the only other room with a TV, one of those old box TVs that would go full static every now and again. I get in there and put something on quietly and go to sleep, but I wake up a couple of hours later and the room is pitch black, other than the light from the static on the TV, which, if you know, is not very much. It's basically a straight low beam that makes some stuff visible, but anything outside that vicinity gets harder and harder to see because of the light. But I can see all of her masks clearly. I went to get up to change the channel, and I noticed I couldn't move. It was like some sort of sleep paralysis. My eyes could move, but my body could not. So I just laid there, 
briefly trying to wait for my body to realize and wake up or move, when I heard a sound like someone tapping their nails on the closet door. Just a little four taps. I'm sure that we all do this when we're bored, but it caught my attention, and I fixed my eyes on the closet door, waiting to hear it again. Within about a minute, I had glanced at the wall that the closet was on, at my aunt's masks, when I noticed one was missing, and I knew because it was the one that I'd gotten her for Mother's Day. I did a double take because I knew where it always was. I didn't pay too much attention to it until I looked back at the TV and could barely see the mask that was missing off the wall, now hardly out of light, but still slightly visible behind the TV. I knew it was the mask by the little pink flower pattern on the left cheek. At first, I thought my aunt had moved it, but no longer than I had had that thought, the mask started to raise very, very slowly. It rose to the ceiling, slowly made its way directly over my face in the bed, where it stayed for a couple of seconds, before slowly descending to what felt like right over my face. I tried to close my eyes, but it didn't help. I could feel it looking at me, and could practically see it doing it with my eyes closed. Then, out of nowhere, the pressure lifted, and I heard the mask break from falling. It fell directly about where it originally had hung, by the closet. I laid there practically in tears, not able to do anything about it. Then it sounded like someone shaking the bedroom door as hard as possible, trying to get in, but it wasn't locked. My aunt and uncle woke up to the sound of the door shaking, came to see what they thought I was doing, until they got in front of the door, and it swung open on its own. As soon as the door opened, it was like my body woke up. I sat up and screamed as loud as possible, and pushed to the corner in the bed, crying. That's when I told them what happened. They knew by the way I was acting that I wasn't kidding, and they would have probably doubted it a bit, had it not been for the door opening on its own. But... That's the end of this one. I have many more, but not like this. I grew up on the beautiful island of Guam. My father was in the military, so we had a nice house on a base. Unfortunately, I was terrified of sleeping in my room, so I slept on my parents' bedroom floor. One evening, I shifted my pillows around while having trouble falling asleep. During the process... I noticed a pale and purple finger that looked like it belonged to a corpse. I stared in horror, unsure what to do, and watched as it slowly retreated under the bed. I covered the spot with a pillow and tried my hardest to sleep, but I just couldn't. One day, I looked under my parents' bed to see bright yellow glowing eyes that definitely didn't belong to one of our cats. It was staring me down, and I felt uneasy like I wasn't safe, and I wasn't meant to see it. In that house, I regularly heard glass shattering in the kitchen, only to discover nothing was broken. There were also heavy footsteps that ran up and down the hallway. From the corner of her eye, my sister often saw someone hanging in my parents' bedroom, only to have it disappear when she looked. I saw shadow people running around in darker areas of the house, my father would tell the spirits to leave in peace, and things would be quiet for a week or two, before getting weird again. I'm originally from Lethbridge, Canada, but I lived in Vancouver for almost five years. Four years for school, and an additional year just to live and work on my own. Most of my time was dedicated to school and work, which was rather uneventful in comparison to the story I'll share here. My first three years in Vancouver, I lived near the water in a mother-in-law-style apartment. If you don't know what that is, it's basically a fully functioning apartment in the lower half of a home. Bathrooms, kitchen, living space, etc. 
It was an absolutely beautiful place to call a temporary home, especially for a college kid. An affordable place in a prime location. Owners who were incredibly nice people who mainly kept to themselves but also acted as very attentive landlords. But it came with its own sort of catch. About three months into living there, I was feeling pretty comfortable. Maybe I was too comfortable, and that's why everything started happening when it did. Either way, three months in, I was having these strange dreams, well, nightmares, paired with waking up suddenly and feeling like I wasn't alone. They would continue on and off for the better part of a year. Normally, the dreams were me standing by the back door. It was made of glass and had large, thick curtains, which I kept closed at night. But during the day, they let in a gorgeous amount of light and offered a small, peekaboo view of the neighboring Victoria Island. In my dreams, however, these curtains were open at night, and the view was nothing like I saw in my waking hours. There were no homes neighboring this one, no telephone wires crossing the skyline. The view was incredible. You could see the entire island. It was like the dreams took me back in time, one where there was just less in the way of buildings and more in the way of trees and nature. Almost magical. Except it's while enjoying this view, I realize I'm cold and wet. Doesn't seem too strange, not at first. But it changes. Not the view or my coldness, but my entire perspective. I hear the bedroom door being kicked in, but I don't turn around. Suddenly, I'm being grabbed from behind, but I manage to escape whoever's attempting to grab me. I never see their face. I never see my face. I'm frantic, and somehow, I understand that if they touch me again, I'm dead. It's the most fear I've ever felt in a dream. Still, to this day, eventually... I make my way to a locked door. It's the door that connects the rest of the home to the mother-in-law apartment. I struggle for far too long and feel as if I'm working with two brains. One who knows this door is never unlocked and one who thinks it should be. Someone's coming. I run from the door and back towards the bedroom where the glass door is. I catch a glimpse of the view one last time just before I'm thrown onto the bed. Before I can see anything else or do anything else, I'm being smothered. I can feel myself struggling to breathe. I know I'm close to passing out, and then one of those brains tells me to wake up. Usually, that's when I'm thrown awake, gasping for air, and feeling like I'm not alone. Though other times, it would be a dream within a dream. I'd wake up have the sensation I wasn't alone, but I'd call out. Hello? Is someone there? I'd get no response, but I'd feel pressure applied to my shoulder, as if someone's hand was on it. As I'd turn to see the hand, I'd be thrown awake. For real this time. Each time I'd wake up for real, I'd never call out to someone, despite feeling a presence. Instead, I'd literally count sheep until I'd fall asleep, not waking again until morning. These types of dreams would come multiple times a week. I started keeping a journal, only to realize it was literally the same dream. I wasn't in control of it, and nothing changed, so I eventually stopped writing about them. Up to this point, I'd never had a reoccurring dream before. Nothing like this. My dreams usually involved me trying to concentrate and getting disrupted, or dreams where, honestly, things just don't make sense. But these dreams, they sort of made sense, but they also felt really real. As time went on, I started to feel a little uneasy around the apartment. I'd spend my days just living in it as one does, but my evenings felt dreadful and that I knew I'd be walking or running through these halls again soon. However, shortly after the dream started, so did everything else. The shower, for example. I'd taken countless showers. Nothing off had ever happened before. But suddenly, when I'd be showering at night, I'd hear yelling. Not just one or two, but continuous yelling and arguing. I could never discern what they were saying. 
but it was clear these were voices. I'd shut the water off and nothing. Eventually, I started playing music in the shower because I couldn't handle the sound of constant arguing. I had no idea how to drown it out without other noise. There was also the reappearing handprint on the glass door. The glass gets fogged up in that room after a shower. You have to ventilate a bit to prevent this, but usually it's so cold I don't crack a window. So eventually, after getting dressed and all of that, I'd open up the shades and crack the back door to let out some of the excess steam. And a few times, I'd see this single handprint on the window right as I did. But I don't mean it was just there. I mean it appeared as I opened the curtains. Then, yes, it would disappear with the rest of the condensation, leading me to believe, oh, that's nothing. I probably touched the window real quick without noticing. I told myself that a lot, but did I ever believe it? Not really. Finally, towards the end of my first year in the apartment, I saw a woman. I only saw her once, but I think that it was the same woman that I'd feel in my dreams, possibly the same woman whose presence I'd felt when I'd wake up. My theory has always been that something happened to her, maybe in that apartment. So yeah, my theory does lean heavily on the existence of ghosts or spirits, but I don't know how else to explain it. One night I was cooking, a little later than I normally would, but I'd forgotten to eat almost all day because of studying and not letting any real light in. Now it was dark, but I still felt like getting a view of the night sky and some fresh air. As my noodles cooked, I made my way to the glass door, opened up the curtains, and cracked the door. As I looked up at the view, the windows were highly reflective since the indoor lights were still on. In the reflection, just behind me, I saw a woman sitting on my bed. She had blonde hair and was facing the other direction. She appeared to be crying. Could I hear her? Before that thought could really go anywhere, I instinctively gasped and turned around. No one was there, quickly facing the glass door again. She was gone. After actually seeing someone outside of a dream, I decided that I'd figure out a way to ask my landlords or the owners of the home if anyone had ever reported something similar. I think at first they thought I was trying to think of an excuse to break my lease, but after talking further, they seemed to entertain my talking, though I didn't get any real answers. The couple had bought the house just two years before I had moved in, though it was built back in the early 50s. Many owners since its time of fruition, and according to the couple, they'd never heard of anything strange, but furthermore... I was their first tenant. So everything continued as it was, only school got more stressful and sleep became more precious than ever. I needed to figure out some way to sleep in peace and not disrupt my living situation. Now, some people may find this next part silly, but I really don't care. It worked. Also, I challenge others to be plagued by night terrors or visions and see what genius plans they come up with. Anyway, one night while lying in bed, I was already feeling emotional about the potential loss of sleep that I could experience, so I started speaking. I don't know who I was talking to, but I like to imagine it was the woman from my dreams. I asked her, Do you need something from me? Obviously, I got no response, so I just kept going. I told her that I was living here now, going to school. I told her who I was, and I asked who she was, with no response. Finally, I told her that I was sorry if something happened to her. I told her that as much as I wish I could change it all, I couldn't do that, but that I thought it was time that she moved on. I told her that sometimes the dreams were a little too scary, so much so that I couldn't sleep. I told her that she didn't have to leave but that I thought she'd be happier if she did. I didn't have any dreams that night, or the remaining two years I was there. At least not those kinds of dreams. The only other thing that happened was the week I was moving out of that place. I was cleaning all the windows and walls, 
I got to the glass doors. I opened the curtains, and, without any condensation in the room at all, I briefly saw a familiar handprint, both appear and disappear, almost instantly. I considered that my official goodbye from the woman I'd silently shared my space with. It's always made me wonder, what exactly makes spirits stay in certain places, and do they have a choice? I've been wanting to share my experiences while working at a nursing home several years ago. I've been employed at that place for several years, but up until my last few weeks working there, I had never believed in anything paranormal. Even working in the nursing field in general, I'd never experienced anything I couldn't explain. The scares that I'd had up to that point were real-life ones. I always liked scary movies, sure, but... I wouldn't consider myself a believer by any means. But after my work at the facility, I started to question everything a little bit. I remember the first time I felt something, it was an evening shift, a Tuesday evening. I remember that because it was my earliest shift of the week. And it would end up being a pretty eventful week. My shift had just begun, and the atmosphere was unusually heavy. It could have been the gloomy, rainy weather. It could have been the various patients that were ill. But as I walked down the dimly lit hallway, I felt the need to enter a resident's room. As I entered Miss Baker's room, I noticed a flickering light. Of course, it was casting an eerie shadow on the wall, which that was hard to ignore. But the temperature, it also seemed to have plummeted. Had Mrs. Baker noticed that as well? I heard what I thought was her faint whisper echo through the room. I couldn't make out the words, but the voice seemed desperate, maybe pleading. Perhaps Miss Baker had felt the cold. I turned to grab her some blankets and adjusted the light near her bed. I apologized for the temperature, told her I'd figure out a way to turn the heat up. But she was confused. She hadn't been cold. She felt a breeze now and then, but she was perfectly comfortable. Not entirely satisfied, I asked if she needed anything or if she'd said something I might have missed. She assured me she was fine, ready for bed, in fact. I tried to dismiss the whispers as my imagination, but that uneasy feeling managed to persist regardless. Over the next few nights, the activity, if you will, escalated. These small but strange occurrences became a nightly routine, some nights coming home to a sleepless night, and filled with stress and anxiety, even though I didn't know why. Doors at the facility seemed to creak open and shut on their own, specifically near Miss Baker's room. I didn't like the lights flickering, especially because it seemed like they were flickering wherever I was or while I was walking under them. Maintenance said they'd check it out, and I even saw a couple of bulbs being changed. Over the next few nights, though, the lights continued to flicker, and only a few nurses seemed to notice them, always when they were around me or nurses around Miss Baker's room. There was more than just the lights to worry about. The sounds of footsteps echoing in the hallways, even if I was the only one there. They were different from standard footsteps that I'd hear down the halls. These felt distant, yet close. Arguably, the most upsetting part were the whispers. Those seemed to follow me wherever I went that week, growing a bit louder, more frequent with each night. They were unintelligible, practically gibberish, but I could sense that they were filled with some sort of pain. It was as if something since past were desperately trying to communicate with anything living and anything being me. I confided in my co-worker and friend, Sarah, finally, hoping that she'd have some rational explanation. To my surprise, she nodded rather curiously and shared her own experiences with the paranormal. Apparently, she'd experienced similar phenomena, but in the basement while doing laundry... There were flickering lights accompanied by whispers, 
dismissing them at first, but eventually deciding she wasn't imagining these things. But like me, she wasn't sure what to do. We both kind of felt terrified, but admitted that it felt good not to be alone. Though we were unsure of what exactly was happening, or how to stop it from happening to us. What I found most intriguing about my interaction with Sarah was that the events she'd experienced were all during the same week. She'd only been there a year, but still, just like me, she'd never experienced anything before. Not like this. She even agreed things seemed to be intensifying each night. So, in search of answers, we delved into the history of the nursing home. Nothing terribly interesting there, though. Since being built in 1945, it had been a city hall building, a library. But since 1989, it had been the nursing home that it is today. Well, it was in 2017. Not sure if it still actually stands. Regardless, our online search yielded no answers. One night, we cautiously explored the basement. It's where Sarah had most of her experiences. While there, we stumbled upon a hidden room of sorts. It almost looked like a floor-length window, but it instead opened to a very small room filled with several filing cabinets. Inside, we discovered old medical records, newspaper clippings, photographs. We expected to uncover some sort of dark past or truth, but for the most part, it looked like archived items that couldn't be stored elsewhere due to space. However, we'd spent our lunch down there, and there were a few records that stood out to us. Ones where residents or patients reported feeling like they couldn't breathe, that something was keeping them awake at night. Some described feeling agonizing pain while sleeping, causing them to wake up and feel as though something heavy was holding them down. It wasn't just one or two we found records with these reports dating all the way back from 89 to 99. We figured that there had to be more, but realized they stopped there, and the remaining records were likely stored securely upstairs. Armed with some strange newfound knowledge, we decided that to confront this so-called spirit head-on would be reckless. So, we acknowledged the sufferings described in the patient's charts, but decided that maybe it was best to leave it alone. After all, our residents all seemed to be fine. No one complained about such things. Best not to rock the boat, we agreed. Over the next few days, the paranormal activity continued, but it gradually subsided after that week. I still don't really know why. It's not like we could totally ignore it. But I remember I kept a close eye on Miss Baker... She continued to be fine and unbothered, though, which was good. The whispers grew fainter. Our electricity seemed to repair itself, or someone may have actually repaired that. I'm not really sure. Sarah and I continued to talk about the events for as long as I can remember. I stopped working there in 2017, but I still talk to her regularly. I told her I was going to share this story, and she said she couldn't wait to hear it be retold. She was always a tad braver than I was when it came to this whole thing. I still can't fully comprehend the events that unfolded there, but I guess it's safe to say I believe in ghosts. This isn't my story exactly, but I heard about it and saw the evidence from those involved. My mother's late boyfriend, who we'll call Steve, grew up in a small town called Oakville. Steve would often take my youngest sisters and my mother to visit family there. He's big on photography, so he was always looking for fun and cool places to take the family where he could take photos. While my brother and I had already moved out, my mom and sisters were still living with Steve at the time. I had already had three kids, so it wasn't feasible for me to join them on these trips. On one particular visit, Steve decided to take them to an old mansion called Greywood Manor which wasn't far from Oakville. The sun was shining, and it was perfect weather for a hike and some photography. After returning home from the somewhat uneventful visit, Steve had the photos developed. This was almost 25 years ago, so they were using rolls of film. 
Surprisingly, every photo, except one, captured the joyous atmosphere of the sunny day. The odd photo, however, showcased Greywood Manor at night during a fierce thunderstorm, with lightning illuminating the sky. Strangely enough, the negative for this photo was sandwiched between the normal photos that depicted the sunny day. No one noticed anything unusual when the photo was taken. It was only discovered by the person developing the film. Steve kept the photo and the negative until his passing this summer, and none of us could explain the inexplicable occurrence. I had the opportunity to see the photos and negatives myself, and they left us all bewildered. I wish I'd taken it with me. To this day, the mystery behind that particular photo remains unsolved. Several years ago, my husband and I purchased our first home in Hoquiam, Washington. We grew up in Grace Harbor and never wanted to leave the coast. It's near the only McDonald's in town. If you know Hoquiam, you know the general three-block radius I'm talking about. Though we don't live there anymore, I don't want to get too specific and have some crazy Christian burn down this house, thinking the devil's in it. And when I say crazy, I mean meth head. And when I say Christian, I mean meth head. When we purchased this house, the lumber yards were still rolling relatively strong in Aberdeen, which was good for Hoquiam. It was a bustling city with so much potential. That would end a few years after the purchase of our home. While we lived there, Devin was a police officer in Ocean Shores, and I worked at the bank in Aberdeen. The house next to ours had a for sale sign outside of it the first half of the year that we lived there. Then another sign was put up saying, New Reduced Price. It would be the next summer when it finally sold to a family with another little girl around Tilly's age. The girls instantly became best friends, and their front yard friendship was the icebreaker for the adults to meet and mingle. Devin and I invited them over for 4th of July for a barbecue. We all hit it off, and the drinks and unfiltered conversations began to flow that night. While the husbands are in the street lighting off fireworks with the kids and other neighbors partying on the block... I'm standing with the wife, Gretchen. She's a short native girl from Tahola and has a mouth of a sailor when she drinks. She leans in real close and says, Can I ask you something without you thinking I'm batshit crazy? I'm thinking, dang, is she going to say something really batshit crazy right now? Because I'd really like my daughter to be able to continue playing with her new best friend. So I ask straight up, How crazy are you talking? praying that she doesn't ask to get high in my bathroom. But she hits me with a curveball and says that she thinks their house is haunted. I'm like, oh, word? She asks me if I know anything about the history of the house, but I tell her we just moved into ours a couple years ago and that their house had been up for sale until they moved in. Gretchen asked if we've experienced anything otherworldly happening at our place, then asks if I've ever felt like I'd fallen out of reality like a sudden rush of irrational, heart-racing fear when nothing is around. The topic continues as the men come back, and while the girls play in Tilly's room, me and Dev sit with our jaws hanging open as Gretchen and Stevie trade stories about the real haunted house bat-shittery going on next door. From disembodied footsteps and whispers to Stevie pulling out his big beer belly and showing us three long purple scratches, wrapping across his ribs, faucets turning on and off randomly through the night, cupboards slamming, super scary shit, the scariest being when Gretchen told us that their daughter almost drowned in the bathtub a few days prior. Gretchen was shampooing her daughter's hair when she felt her daughter's head get pulled from her hands. She sank underwater, and at first, Gretchen thought that she was playing a joke, so she waited just a second for her to pop back up, but as Gretchen watched the shampoo bubbles begin to pop and melt in the water, she saw her daughter at the bottom of the tub, with her eyes and mouth wide open. A look of horror was frozen on her face. But there were no bubbles coming from her nose or mouth. Seeing this, Gretchen quickly pulls her body from the water. She was breathing, but her body and expression went limp and lifeless when she left the water. Gretchen and Stevie threw her into the truck and ripped out to the hospital up the hill. Doctors there couldn't find anything wrong with her. As the conversation continued, 
We drunkenly joked that they were always welcome to stay at our place any time the paranormal stuff became too much. Then, almost immediately after our small laughter subsided, like we manifested that to be the plan for the night, Dev points out the window and goes, No fucking way. I go look out the blinds over to Gretchen and Stevie's house. From the side window, we can see their kitchen window and a bedroom window on the floor above. In that window... We watch as the light in the room turns on and off, over and over. Gretchen and Stevie don't even leave the table to look. To this day, I don't know why they would all go home that night, even after Dev had offered them the guest bedroom. I guess it was that liquid courage on Stevie's prideful lips. It evoked his alpha male alter ego. I also think that he was trying to show off to my cop husband, but he stood up and was like, fuck that. I'm not getting kicked out of my house. His drunk ass storms up the stairs and kicks open the door of our daughter's bedroom, scaring the shit out of the sleeping girls. He grabs his daughter and the family leave that night, determined to handle their poltergeist problem. Devin and I are just kind of stunned, a little drunk, but mainly a bit concerned for our neighbors. Like a bunch of creeps, we post up by the side window and see if we can catch any of the action. For the most part, the house seems asleep. But every few minutes, just as I would get bored, the lights would start flickering in various rooms of the house. I realized this was something that probably had been happening all the time, but just come to our attention that night. Gretchen and I follow up the next day. She says that she and Stevie are having a disagreement about how to handle the problem. Stevie wanted to bring in a priest, whereas Gretchen wanted to bring in an authentic shaman or move altogether. I was in no more of a position then than I am now to be suggesting things, but I told her that in the interim, she and her family were welcome to stay with us. They were gone before the end of the summer. Though we didn't experience the happenings ourselves, the area just felt a bit more dim without the family next door. And this home sat vacant once more, only now we had this weird knowledge of strange happenings going on inside. That house stayed empty until we moved almost two years later, and it always made me uncomfortable. Comparatively, our house was only on the market for a few months before it sold. We opted not to disclose to the buyers that they had a haunted house next door, but I'm sure they figured it out eventually. Oddly enough, it wasn't even the ghost house that made us eventually sell, and I'm still proud to be from the harbor, go Grizzlies, That being said, we moved to Texas after one of those crazy meth heads tried to lure our daughter out of our front yard. The homeless addict population growth was becoming an epidemic, and we couldn't raise our Tilly in that mess. So we moved. Well, that's all I've got as far as ghost stories, so thanks for reading. Back in 1997, I lived in what I would call a bad neighborhood. It was in the San Fernando Valley, so it wasn't the worst that L.A. had to offer. The apartment was under the stairs halfway to the back. The rent was cheaper than the other apartments, and I was glad to have gotten it. It was just me and my girlfriend at the time living there. What was odd off the bat was that it had two steps from the door to the floor of the apartment. I don't know why, but it was the only one. In this apartment, it was cold almost all the time. Despite the outside temperature, the kitchen and living room were open to each other, and the door led to the bedroom. You could see 80% of the apartment from the bedroom. The first odd thing that happened was that night. I could hear someone walking around outside my door, and then knock. Sometimes I was in the living room and could clearly see that no one was out there. A few weeks in... The TV and radio would start to turn on, and then the volume would go up. At the time, I figured that someone had similar electronics and that that was causing it. It wasn't until a drawer came open in the kitchen and something fell out onto the floor one night. That's when I started to really wonder. It was my knife drawer, and the chef's knife was on the floor. I was in my bedroom. I could see across the apartment, and no one had been there. I started to ask the neighbors, but they mostly wanted to keep to themselves. 
The next night, I woke up to quiet sobbing that stopped when I went into the living room. The next day, I struck up a conversation with an older resident. I asked about my apartment, and he smiled. He told me that years back, there were some gang members that lived there. They used to make noise and trouble, and everyone stayed away from them. One day, they all got into a fight in the apartment and stabbed someone to death. They just up and left him there, and it took almost a week or so for someone to call the police, as it had started to smell. They couldn't get the smell out because it was in the subfloor. The solution was to tear out all of the carpet and tile the cement under it. Looking at the rough cement, one-foot floor around the whole apartment, it made sense. He then told me there was more. I was like, great. The next people who would live there had a teenage daughter, and she had a boyfriend in the building. They broke up later, and he would watch her come and go with hate in his eyes. Luckily for him, he didn't hurt her physically, but what he did do was hang himself on the stairs, just outside her door, looking at it. He knew that she left for work early, and of course, she found him. Later, I talked to the lady that lived in the apartment where her dead boyfriend lived. She said that she could hear someone opening her door and then walk down the hallway towards my apartment. I did not renew my lease after a year of ghosts and the actual dangerous gang members that lived in these apartments. I'm a 29-year-old female in northern Louisiana. My husband and I just moved out here with our son after my brother died two months ago. He didn't have any kind of will, so everything automatically just came to me. And since we were living in a cramped, slummy apartment, we decided to move. My brother overdosed, collapsed in the hallway, but we've always been skeptics, so the possibility of a haunting wasn't even on our radar. I was barely holding it together in general. I can't stress how much that kind of stuff never remotely occurred to us, even after things started happening. It still took a long time for our minds to go there. We were so busy the first week that we dismissed a lot of strange noises as animals living in the walls. The house is in a heavily wooded rural area, so it seemed like an obvious answer. It was only after we finished getting everything unpacked that Nolan, my husband, started paying attention to the noises. Once he pointed it out, I agreed it sounded strange, like something big is clawing at the actual wall. Any insulation between it and the animal is gone. There's more than just a squirrel or rodent running around in the crawl spaces. This is more like a huge raccoon got really pissed off and started tearing away into the home. We didn't know what to do. Our son is only three. We didn't want to risk a possibly rabid animal getting inside, and I didn't want Nolan anywhere near it either, so we called animal control. After their second visit, they said the only thing they found was a family of squirrels, which were safely relocated. But we insisted that there had to be more. We showed them a video of a particularly intense scratching incident. It convinced them to check again, and larger traps were placed, but nothing else was captured. It got to the point that animal control recommended that we call the police in case we had a squatter. We were immediately freaked out. I'd seen body cam footage of that shit on YouTube, so we called the cops. They checked everywhere, but there was no trash or makeshift bedding like they'd usually find in those circumstances. If not for the video, I don't think they would have believed us, but they agreed the noise was concerning and asked us to call them the next time it happened. Nolan didn't tell me until later, but they were worried someone was coming in and out purely for the sake of scaring us. We heard it the next night, and the same officers returned, but it stopped less than a minute before they arrived. They searched everywhere, but still came up empty-handed. The officers were kind enough to stay for an extra 20 minutes, just in case it started again, but no such luck. During that time, we shared our whole story of why we moved here, and the police suggested it could be my brother's ghost. That was the last time we involved authorities. 
not because we were offended, but we were starting to think the same thing ourselves. The police being involved was all we had left grounding us to reality. It made it real, tangible. But after hearing them say it too, that was hard. It took close to a month for those events to play out. But that wasn't the only thing going on during that period. Our son never had a problem sleeping in his own room until we moved here. At first, we blamed the combination of animal noises on top of being in a new place. We let him stay in our room while he adjusted, but we were equally unsuccessful on this front. If the noises happened during the day, we would take Grace into it and explain exactly how animals sometimes crawl into people's homes to build their nests. Then I found several YouTube videos of cute, fluffy raccoons being safely relocated. If anything, it worked too well. Grayson was not only no longer afraid, he was adamant that we needed to adopt the raccoons. Since he was no longer afraid of the noises, we thought that he would return to his room. But then he told a horrifying story about a man coming in and sleeping next to him. I almost fainted until he added that the man had a purple face, puffy, blue lips, and a chin covered in whipped cream, like a cartoon character. We thought it must be imaginary, and assumed everything traced back to the new environment. We should have explained the noises sooner. By this point, animal control had set the first traps, so we were thinking that it would be over any day now. Clearly, that wasn't the case and things with the purple man continued to progress. Grayson began having nightmares that would keep us awake. So Nolan and I began taking turns sleeping in our son's room, starting with my husband, since he had to work the next morning. At breakfast, I asked how he slept, expecting the answer to be positive, but he said the noises were even louder in the back, to the point that it freaked him out a little bit. I had the same experience on my first night, but then things were quiet for a day or two. Then, on one of Nolan's turns, he randomly got in bed with us around 2 a.m. He tried not to wake me, but he was shaking like a leaf. I assumed that he must have been cold and went back to sleep. The next thing I knew it was morning, and Nolan was still awake. He followed me into the kitchen while I made breakfast, and said that he felt like he was losing his mind. The scratching had woken him up again, and he rolled over to grab his water from the nightstand. When his eyes opened, he was facing the hallway through the open door, and a man that looked like my brother walked by. Nolan jumped out of bed, chased after him, but he couldn't find any trace of the guy. He had gone out right behind him, but no one was there. I didn't know how he didn't wake up during all of this, but he peeked in on us before checking every room but nothing was out of place. Then, when he finally got into bed, he couldn't stop listening for footsteps. At first, I thought he dreamed the whole thing, and it just scared him so badly that he woke up and thought it was all one event. But this was also the same day that Animal Control had advised speaking with the police, so we were extra freaked out by their suggestion. I admittedly panicked pretty hard at first, but after the police did their search, I began to look at everything from a calmer perspective. It just seemed too unlikely that we would happen to get some kind of invisible ninja squatter. So, I stuck to my original theories and stayed in the other room as planned. As expected, the scratching noise eventually woke me up, so I looked around but saw nothing and no one. I quickly fell back asleep, and even with that one interruption... It was the most sleep I'd gotten since this all started. The next night, however, is what did me in. When the scratching noise came, I just laid there waiting for it to stop. And it did. But then someone sat at the foot of the bed, and my heart stopped. When I opened my eyes, the weight vanished. But it didn't feel like anyone stood up. It was just there one second, and gone the next. I almost retreated into the master bedroom, but the longer I was awake, the more I began to doubt myself. Obviously, no one could have sat on the bed and vanished into thin air, so I calmed down enough to fall back asleep. 
and that's when I had an incredibly vivid dream of my brother standing over me during the night. He didn't look normal. He was dead. His face was almost purple. His lips were blue. And there was something off-white, kind of like vomit, around his mouth and down his chin. Suddenly, that description didn't sound like a cartoon anymore. I told a friend what was going on, and she fully believes my brother is haunting us. But I don't want to believe that. Not because I'm a skeptic, but because I can't cope with the fact that my brother could be trapped in that state for, what, ever? I don't even know how that's supposed to work. It was right after this that we had our final chat with the police, and why their ghost joke made us so uneasy. Unfortunately, my son never got to meet his uncle, but I set out a handful of pictures in front of Grayson, and I asked, do any of them resemble the scary man? I was even more freaked out when he picked up the picture of my brother, so I started researching spirits and hauntings like crazy. We tried different cleansings and simple rituals, but things only seemed to stay the same or get worse. Not long after this, Grayson was taking a nap on the couch while I cleaned the kitchen, and he suddenly started crying, loud, like he was hurt. I ran into the living room and scooped him up just as he was running out. I saw the scratches immediately, two red welts spreading across his neck. That's when I knew this thing wasn't my brother. It was both a relief and extra terrifying all at once. We still don't know what it is. And we don't really care now that Grayson is with Nolan's mother until we can leave. It hurts me to sell the house and the land, but I know my brother will always be part of us. We don't need a place to be close to him. And I know he would want what's best for his nephew. We've talked to a real estate agent and everything is ready to go, but we can't afford to move until we have a buyer, so we're just trying to hang in there. If anyone has any tips on how to survive in the meantime... All advice is much appreciated. It doesn't bother us as much as it did Grayson, but I've woken up with scratches on my back, and Nolan has seen the guy in broad daylight on three separate occasions now. I should say firstly that I've never harmed any living creature for pleasure. I do have blood on my hands, mostly from my service in the military when I was a younger man, PTSD never goes away. It's an uncontrollable, unconscious reaction from a lifetime of memories lived by another man, a young and naive man, the husk I grew to emerge from. When I discarded my old shell, talks of it could reanimate the corpse to dance in vivid memories so real you'd swear you were there again. Memories I have no interest in revisiting, but I believe prefacing this is necessary in order for the next part to fully make sense. After discharge, I was still active in the ready reserve for a few more years. My first wife, Jackie, and I fell in love with the suburbs of D.C. Jackie was a nurse at the Veterans Hospital. I would struggle to hold down stable employment through the first year as a civilian. My mind was damaged, and I was barely functioning. The worst episode occurred when I was working at a Safeway. I was on a knee opening boxes of milk to start stocking in a big refrigeration unit. The cooling fans in there are loud. A co-worker walks up behind me to put something in the refrigerator. I don't notice her, but she accidentally knocks over a jar and it explodes. The noise startled me so much that it had triggered a flashback, and I black out. Blacking out is something unreal. At first, my eyes were fixed on brown cardboard. Through the holes, the rows of gold-capped glass jars, each filled with white milk, that would clink and slosh around as I pulled them out. Then, in the blink of an eye, I realize I'm standing. My co-worker's back is pressed against my chest. My left arm was holding her like a bear hug, while in my right hand was a box cutter. The door to the refrigeration unit is opened, and in the doorway, shoppers are staring in. In front of them, my boss has his hands up and is walking towards me. My ears fully dial back into frequency, and everything hit me all at once. I instantly release the woman and drop the box cutter. 
I was lucky not to have gone to prison that day. They decided not to call the police. My boss served in World War II. He understood the horrors of war. But he could also see that I wasn't fit for normal life yet. As I scrambled to find other work, the offer that we'd previously put down on a house had finally been accepted. Thankfully, Jackie was smart enough with money. She'd stashed away the money in a coffee tin under her vanity for months. We had just enough to move in, but in order for us to continue our residency, I needed to find a job fast. The first couple of months after moving in were the most stressful and put the most strain on me and Jackie's marriage. We did everything in our power to make the house feel like a home, but it just never did. Even with the heat up and the lights on, the cold, dark energy was inescapable. I was drained every morning because I'd be plagued by night terrors almost every night. The dreams I had were also no longer amidst the backdrop of North Vietnam. Instead, the setting began to resemble home. Visions of my neighborhood after a catastrophic disaster. The sky above is colored orange from a glow of distant fires, and violence fills the street as neighbors turn on one another for resources. Internalizing my trauma was the worst thing that I could have done for myself and my relationship, but we were both increasingly stressed, both at our breaking points. I kept it from Jackie, in fear of becoming more of a burden in her eyes, further scrutinizing my sanity and ability to provide a stable household. Soon enough, the night terrors would reach a level I've never experienced. I began to question if I was awake or asleep when they decided to haunt me. In our bedroom, we had a walk-in closet with sliding doors. I was reading a book late one night when I heard the wooden doors of the closet quietly rattle. I looked up to see them both gently slide open. I got chills like never before, and the hair stood up on the back of my neck, then my whole body. I'm staring into the closet. The shade of darkness grows deeper the further back my eyes try to focus, then, from the floor up, the blackest of colors inside the closet begins to morph and take shape, eating every ounce of reflecting light. It resembled a slow-rising plume of smoke, or vines, as it started to grow into a human shape. The figure was female, and the smoke she grew from continued to fall through the ground like an endless dress. I did the only thing that I thought I could do, the only thing that I used to do when I'd see images of war, and that was to close my eyes tight, try to fall asleep before they became too real. I'd come to find out that that was only the entity introducing herself to me. She would be a fixture in my peripherals during the day and night. I would see her take form in the corners of the room, but I would never interact or look over. She looked like what I used to see during active duty. The ghosts of men you killed in battle that day follow you on your march back to the barracks. With the moon at our backs, our shadows in front of us would be joined by other shadows. Sometimes you could outrun them. Sometimes they'd run with you. Observations everyone in the platoon experienced, but didn't always share out loud. The first winter Jackie and I spent in our house was bitterly cold. A new pipe would burst seemingly once a week, and I'd have to crawl under the house to fix it. I hated getting down there in the crawl space. That's when I'd be tormented by this female entity. I could feel her crawling around with me, faster than I could move. My flashlight would catch her as I swiveled for tools. I'd suppress my fear just enough to keep my hands from shaking as I finished the job. Then that same winter... We receive a call from Jackie's sister. She'd sustained a pretty extensive injury slipping on ice. Jackie would need to stay with her through the new year to help out. Jackie had to catch two buses to get to work every day. She and I would talk on the phone every night, and I would visit her on lunch breaks, but it wasn't the same. We missed each other more than we knew. Ironically, I think this time apart made us appreciate each other more. I filled my time with odd jobs around town, doing my best to stay out of the house as long as I could, before having to return in the evening. I was alone, but I wasn't. 
It was impossible not to feel like I was constantly being stalked within the confines of my home. Out the window, I watched my neighbors hang up Christmas lights without a care in the world. The gutters and doors of my house remained bare. No wreath, no tree, no decorations. There was no point in wasting the effort if I was going to be the only one pretending to enjoy it. With Jackie coming home for the new year, I decided to stop feeling sorry for myself and spruce the place up a little bit. I picked up some candles that were festively scented, some new blankets for the couch, all of our favorite foods. It was important to ring in the new year correctly, I thought. However, once Jackie got home, she told me that being with her sister had been stressful, yes, but she also felt relief. Relief from her night terrors. Relief from the shadows. At first, she thought that I was offended because I hadn't said a word. But I wasn't offended. I completely understood. I told her as much, finally. And then we officially started swapping stories. I learned her dreams were slightly different from mine. She described chaos similar to mine. But also personal nightmares like losing a limb, watching me die horrific deaths over and over the most unsettling, yet reaffirming of all. She also described the same figure, and she confirmed she'd seen the figure while she was awake. She was folding clothes in the living room, watching TV, but she had that intense feeling, like she was being watched. Glancing towards the hallway, she focused on the darkness, feeling that it was darker than it should be. Then she saw it, the black plume formed the shape of a woman, cloaked in continuous darkness. Jackie said she froze and just closed her eyes tightly, praying that it would go away. When she opened her eyes, it was gone. Being at her sister's, she said, it felt as though a giant weight had been lifted. She believed the weight to be our house. We both couldn't believe that we kept it from one another but I guess I understand it from both sides. At first, I thought we felt better. Having it all out in the open, we were motivated to try and figure out what to do about this feeling, what to do about the house. And I wish that we'd made it that far. But for several reasons, some I can explain, others I can't, everything really did start to fall apart. Our careers, the house, our relationship itself... We had no time to do much of anything except for work and try to get some sleep in between doing so. Night terrors continued, shadows intensified, manifesting in more places than just the closets, the hallways, the corners. It was everywhere. This figure haunted us until we surrendered. Jackie and I ended up filing for divorce after we sold the house. There was no bitterness there, but we were both exhausted. We didn't stay close, but we ran into each other maybe six years after the divorce at a mutual friend's funeral. I wasn't going to bring it up, but Jackie did, asking me if I ever saw that figure again. Honestly, I hadn't thought about it. In fact, I was sure that I hadn't thought about it since the moment we sold that house. And she said the same thing. Until Jackie, I always assumed all of my nightmares were my own. Any horror I experienced, I assumed, was superficial or the result of recalling a more horrific time. Though I don't know exactly what we experienced, I at least know that I wasn't alone in that one. Hi, I'm new here, and I don't normally enjoy spooky stuff, but my little sister is kind of obsessed, and she swore that this would be a safe place to share my story. I'm not even sure if it's a good one, but I'm getting pretty freaked out, and I feel like a nutbag when I try to tell my friends about it. I live in a small town where every other building has been named a historical landmark, so all the homes and businesses are extremely old. Many of the bigger houses downtown have been separated into individual apartments, including where I live. It would normally be too expensive for my pay grade, but the landlord offered me a deal that I couldn't refuse for taking the basement quarters. 
I figured that there was some gruesome murder story behind her generosity, but she said the reduction was to compensate for the lack of cell service. Apparently, all of the concrete does a bang-up job of blocking our reception, unless you leave your phone sitting on the window, which, don't forget, is a tiny rectangle under the ceiling, because we're in a basement. But at the end of the day, I was desperate to get my own place, so I took it. I should also add that you can't gain access to any part of the building without knowing the gate code. So it's not like random people can just wander inside. Once you enter, the ground floor and upstairs apartments are in one direction, and the stairs for my place are tucked off to the left. There's nothing down there except for my apartment and an old storage closet, meaning there's no reason for anyone to be on those steps except for myself and the maintenance man. Just a quick note about that guy. He's an elderly widow who doesn't even live in the building. He takes several days to come around here when there's a problem, and I've never seen him move faster than a snail. I'm not saying that he's not capable of it. I'm just saying it's extremely unlikely that he's responsible for my problems, considering it would be very difficult for him to come and go without being noticed. Each time he appears, every tenant swarms him. When you descend the basement stairs, there's a long hallway with the closet at the end, and my door is on the right about midway down. Every step you take, no matter how soft, echoes, so it's very hard to be stealthy, even if you want to be. Towards the end of my first week there, I was working on my laptop when I heard someone run down the stairs and through the hall. Thinking it must be a kid, I stuck my head out the door to chase them off. Only, no one was there. It's a straight hallway. From my door, I have a clear view of each end. And nobody was there. They couldn't have left before I looked, either. I'm positive the footsteps were on the closet end of the hall when I got the door open. Ultimately, I decided that it must have been someone upstairs, and I went back to work. After my first month in the apartment and having a few friends over... I became very accustomed to the difference in what it sounds like when someone is descending my steps or the ones above me. The difference in volume alone is unmistakable, but my stairs are also the only ones that make a loud echo. The second incident happened the night before Halloween. This time I heard someone scream before pounding their way down my steps and through the hall. I got to the door just as the steps were passing my apartment but the second it opened, they vanished mid-stride. I even considered the possibility that they were hiding in the closet, but there were only cleaning supplies inside. Over the next couple of weeks, I put a great deal of effort into befriending one of the tenants. As it turns out, there are no kids living in my building. The lady in the attic apartment sometimes has her grandkids over, but they weren't visiting on either occasion I heard footsteps. It happened for a third time a few days ago. This was the worst one yet, and what prompted me to finally seek advice. There was no scream, but the footsteps sounded louder than ever, and instead of running past my door, they stopped right in front of it. My heart stopped dead in my chest when the banging began. I somehow found the courage to look through the peephole, and saw a frightened young woman staring in the direction of the stairs as she continued her desperate knocking. I instantly forgot all about the possibility of ghosts or whatever spooky story I'd created in my mind. That girl was there, outside my door, terrified, but very real, until I actually yanked the door open, and no one was there. Again, there wasn't so much as a trace of the echo left from her insistent knocks. Also... There's no history of mental illness on either side of my family. That's probably a good thing to mention. I just don't understand. Is it possible for just the hallway to be haunted? Because nothing has ever happened inside my apartment, and the other tenants have sworn that they've never experienced anything strange in the building. I don't know. I'm at a loss. Part of me knows that I should try to learn if someone fitting her description has died here. But I really don't want to know the answer. Someone, please, just tell me what to do. I used to live just outside of Redwood County, Minnesota. 
And around the age of 16, my parents started allowing me to go camping on my own. That summer, I was in southwest Minnesota with some friends, and we decided to camp inside the reservation. After a long day of bullshitting around, we found a spot and decided to set up our tents. It was pretty beautiful out there, super serene and quiet. We definitely felt like we were on our own out there, but at 16, I painted us as pretty damn fearless, so we weren't bothered, at least not yet. Eventually, it was nightfall, and though still not afraid, the area held a different kind of quiet. It was almost silent. I have no idea what time I fell asleep, but I know it was around 3 a.m. when I woke up. For a few seconds, I wasn't sure why, but then I heard my name being called from outside my tent. It was my friend Aaron's voice, and he was really trying to get my attention. I could also hear my other friend Jeremy shushing Aaron, telling him to be quiet. I didn't say a word. I just started feeling around and looking for a light. Before I got to it, though, I heard something in the silence. But it's like my brain couldn't connect what it was for a minute until it was so loud and so obvious. It was the sound of horses running. But also what I can only describe as war cries. Almost immediately after I heard the sounds, I realized this was probably what Aaron was trying to bring to my attention. I unzipped my tent because I wanted to see if I could see anything. Jeremy was already outside of his tent, and he was looking around like he had the same idea. We both started to step out closer to the extinguished campfire to investigate the sounds. I couldn't believe how clear they were, how eerie they were. Something about being there suddenly felt wrong, but I couldn't, I still can't, pinpoint why. Shortly after that thought, Aaron walked out of his tent armed with a paintball gun. Not sure what good he thought he was going to do with it, but it said to me that he was scared. I guess we all kind of were by now. After an exchange of, do you guys hear that, we all decided that it was something real. We were on the reservation, so it was most likely that the noises were coming from there, somehow. Aaron was paranoid it was someone's way of telling us to get lost, a warning of some kind before a real brutal attack took place. I didn't think that sounded right, but I didn't have much else to offer as to what I thought it was. To me, it couldn't be anything other than what it sounded like. Horses. War cries. It seemed to envelop the whole area, yet was only a whisper at the same time. Suddenly, I felt a small brush of wind against my face, followed by an unusual thump sound right next to my ear. It sounded like something had hit the tree directly behind me, but this time I didn't stick around to investigate. Almost on cue, we all funneled into one car, drove a mile or so into somewhat civilization, and did something that emulated sleep for the next couple of hours. Then, because there's something about daylight, it gives you courage that somehow dissipates when it's dark, we decided to drive back to the campsite. Courage may be a strong word. In reality, we still had to get Aaron's car and the rest of our shit. So what choice did we really have? Once we got there, everything was exactly how we'd left it. Jeremy and Aaron started packing up almost right away, but I had to check something out first. Chances were we wouldn't be coming back to this place again, but something told me, something stronger than just my curiosity, that I would find something in that tree. The tree that had been behind me the night before. I had heard something strike it. Inspecting the tree trunk, I found what appeared to be the odd end of an arrowhead with the pointed end embedded in the tree. Part of me wanted to take it out, but a bigger part of me felt like that was a bad idea. I told the guys to come over and take a look. We all agreed. That's definitely what we were looking at. I decided to pack up my tent. The guys were still over by the tree when Aaron called me back over. They'd found something else. It looked like the piece of an axe. Part of the sharp end, but no handle attached and missing the piece of material that would connect the two parts together. It made me want to find the handle, and though I never did, we found more of these assorted pieces of history. 
At least that's what I assumed they were. Full-sized arrowheads in various colors of gray, red, and brown. But also, there was this white material that sort of littered the area if you looked real close, or if you knew what you were looking for. They were pieces of pottery, clearly scattered now, but at one time I imagined they were full. We rummaged around the area for what felt like hours, but after we realized we could likely do this forever and never come up short, we decided to call it a day. At one point, Jeremy asked if we should take any of it with us, but we opted not to. I'm shocked and grateful that even at 16, we had enough wherewithal not to take anything with us. Pretty sure we were all just grateful, too, that nothing bad had happened to us or our stuff. I mean, besides being scared out of our minds. Though, something tells me that if we weren't so respectful, things could have been a whole lot scarier. Hey there. I'm a night janitor at a hospital, and I spend most of my time at work listening to creepypasta narrations. But I've recently found this channel, and I thought it would be fun to send in one of my stories about this place. We've got plenty of ghosts, but after working here a while, you get used to them. For the most part, no one's ever experienced anything malicious. Just the friendly or curious types of spirits. In the five years I've been working there... Only one incident has really frightened me, and it just happened last week. One of the places I'm responsible for cleaning is the morgue. We recently had a man pass away after a late-night motorcycle accident, and his body was still on one of the tables when I went in to clean. It's not uncommon for a few to be left out. If there's no one on duty to check them in, the orderlies will leave them for whoever has the morning shift. It's not really like the movies where a head and toe tag are sticking out of each sheet, at least not at our hospital. Those sheets are plenty big enough to cover the whole body, so it's not quite as creepy as you see on TV. Well, not usually. I saw the motorcycle guy as soon as I walked in, and his sheet had fallen to the side, leaving his face and part of his chest exposed. Now, I have a pretty strong stomach. You have to in order to work here, but this guy was messed up. I nearly puked when I saw his face. He only had one eye left, and it stared at me with the little skin left around it. I quickly pulled the sheet back over him, and I went back to work. When I turned to leave, the sheet had not only fallen halfway down his face again, its head was turned to the side, still looking at me. There's no draft or fans blowing in the morgue. Not a single thing could have moved that sheet. I pulled it back over the man for a second time and ran out of there like a scared child. By the time I woke up the following afternoon, I felt pretty silly. What did I know about dead bodies anyway? And that one was so messed up. Who's to say it wasn't just settling or whatever corpses do? I chat with the doctors often. So I wanted to ask that night, but I never quite worked up the nerve. Each way I imagined saying it just made me feel crazy. Either it was a completely normal occurrence that scared me for no reason, or it wasn't normal, and they would think that I'd lost my mind. That's certainly a more logical conclusion than a dead man was watching me. When I made it back to the morgue, I was relieved to see no bodies were left and set about my work. As I was emptying the trash, I began to hear a soft scratching sound, like something hard scraping a metal surface. I couldn't stand the idea of wondering about it too, so I followed the sound to the freezer drawers. I'm sure you've seen them on TV, the wall of big square cubicles where the bodies are stored until claimed by family. They have metal tables that slide in and out. Yeah, I'm sure you know. It took all of my courage to look inside. The first two were empty, but I finally found the right one on my third try. As soon as the door was open, the noise immediately stopped. I had to know if it was the same guy from yesterday. So I pulled out the body just to peek at his face and had to stifle a scream when I saw an exposed hand sitting atop the white sheet. Most of its flesh was gone. 
likely removed while sliding down the highway because it was definitely the motorcycle guy again. I was genuinely sick to my stomach when I confirmed it by viewing his face. His fingers were nothing but bone, which would have been perfect for making the sound I heard. Not wanting to be in there another second, I quickly put everything back as I found it and got the hell out of there. But just as I was exiting, the noise started again. I didn't stop to see how long it lasted. I got back upstairs and didn't say a word to anyone. Thankfully, I was off for the next two days, but I do have to go back tonight. Even though the body is probably gone by now, I still have an overwhelming sense of dread. Honestly, I may call in sick. I really can't decide. At my high school, there was one building that was older than the rest. It was the smallest building on campus, and by the time I went there, it was only used for wood shop and mechanics, two classes I never took. Rumor had it that the bathrooms over there were disgusting and horrifying, and that if you were between portables and the newer buildings, you might as well hold it and keep going. A void at all costs was sort of the mantra. Easy enough, each building has ample bathrooms that weren't so far away from each other. It was possible. Easy enough until junior year. Junior year, my boyfriend was in mechanics, six period. Since I had a free period, I would visit him in that building all the time. The teachers in these areas were, for lack of a better word, more chill. They didn't care about your hall passes, if you should or shouldn't be there. They just care that you wore safety gear while you were inside the actual shop. One day, I'd already made my way to the shop. I'd already put on the gear and realized I had to pee. I remembered the lore behind this horrific bathroom, but I figured, how bad could it be? I gave a wave to my boyfriend and headed towards the bathroom. It sat between the mechanic shop and the wood shop, tucked in the back of a hallway lined with small lockers for students to hold their belongings. The first thing I wasn't a fan of was how cold it was in there and that the lights didn't automatically turn on like the other bathrooms. It was old, all right, but all in all, I wasn't seeing what the big deal was. Once I got the lights on, I didn't see anything that stuck out as immediately more disgusting than any other public restroom. I even felt comfortable putting my goggles on the counter. They looked clean. So I go about my business, and as I'm finishing up, I hear the sound of hard plastic bounce and hit the tile floor followed by a couple of distinct footsteps. Naturally, I freeze because, what the fuck? I lean down as far as I can from my seated position and confirm the sound was my goggles hitting the tile, but I didn't see anything to explain the footsteps. Not gonna lie, I was creeped out, so I sped things up and got myself into a slightly less vulnerable position. As soon as I flushed the toilet, the lights went out. At first... I assumed it was a timer or something, but the more I stood there in the dark, I questioned my own logic. They weren't like the other buildings. This had to be my boyfriend fucking with me. Looking under the stall wouldn't do me any good now in the dark, so I jumped out of the bathroom stall in an attempt to scare my boyfriend or whatever other creep was inside. Nobody screamed, so I lunged for the light switch and turned the lights on. Only, the switch was still flipped upwards. The lights should have been on. I quickly opened the door to see if anyone else was around, but it was empty, and all the other lights in the building were on. It was quiet. Then, I heard the sound of rushing water. The sound of a toilet flushing. It scared me so much that I literally just ran out of the bathroom and towards the end of the hallway. I turned around and just stood there for a moment, I thought if someone else was there that they would walk out any second, and then I could just move on. After a couple of minutes, I figured I might as well go check it out, grab my goggles, wash my hands, see who the fuck was in there. The first thing I noticed was the light switch was now flipped down. Maybe I did that in my panic. I couldn't remember, so I flipped them on. They did as lights should do and turned on. I grabbed my goggles and noticed that all of the stall doors were open. Before washing my hands, I thought, 
Let's just see if maybe one of these toilets is an automatic flush. I can accept faulty wiring or poor plumbing. Except not. They were all the same toilet. The bathroom was old, and for all I knew, these were the original toilets. Nothing automatic or fancy about them. Washing my hands, I was still trying to run through any and all possibilities in my head. I decided that I would stay in there for a moment, see if the lights did the same thing. I walked into the same stall and sat there for a while. I got my phone out and set a timer for five minutes. I knew that was far too long, but figured it was better safe than sorry. Sitting there, even in the light, I decided there was something horrifying about this bathroom. It just had nothing to do with its hygiene. The light stayed on, but as I sat in silence, I started to hear small sounds. I wasn't imagining them. I could hear the sounds of the shop in the distance, people laughing, metal clanking, but I also heard footsteps from within the bathroom, the unmistakable sound of someone walking. And this time, I realized it was three steps clearly, and the fourth one faded out. I was so entranced by this realization that I forgot to be scared for a moment until my alarm went off, causing me to nearly drop my phone in the toilet. I managed to save it that time, but moments after, before I could leave the stall, I felt someone tap my shoulder. It was so clearly the feeling of someone's finger tapping me that I screamed. I proceeded to actually drop my phone in the toilet. Retrieving the phone became my new focus. I grabbed my phone, dried it off the best I could before leaving, but I listened once more. I heard nothing. I was pissed that I hadn't thought to record it before my phone became waterlogged, and I was pissed about the phone, too. I stomped out of the bathroom and went to tell my boyfriend what had just happened, but the whole class was gone. I walked through the shop and towards the back outdoor garage. The entire class had been out there for at least ten minutes. They were working on oil changes today, so my boyfriend, along with a few others, were currently under the shop vehicles working. I decided to cut out and head back to the main building towards the library. I still couldn't believe everything that had happened. I text my boyfriend that he could find me at the library, and eventually he did. I finally told him everything, and instead of taking me seriously, he laughed and said that they all assumed I was just taking a shit. I was not impressed, so I basically kept my little ghost story to myself after that. And honestly, truly, truly, secretly wished that someday, whatever it was, would scare the shit out of him, too. Unfortunately, I never got that satisfaction. And something tells me that even if something did happen, none of those guys would have ever said a word. Either way, that place was haunted or something. I stuck to using any other bathroom for the remainder of my high school career. Because sure, it's fun to think about now, but at the time... It was scary as fuck. Always been curious if anyone else ever experienced anything there. It's been up and running for a long time. I've also wondered if I just so happened to talk to the one guy too stupid to realize if something was haunted or not. Who knows, but thanks for reading. Nothing, and I mean nothing, will ever be more eventful than the Thanksgiving I had in 2005. I was meeting my boyfriend's family for the first time. They were hosting us along with his sister and her boyfriend. Okay, names. My boyfriend at the time was named Arden. His sister's name was Valina, and her man was Cole. When we got to the house, it was midday, and we were the first ones to arrive. It gave me a chance to get to know his mom and dad and have their undivided attention focused on us. Both parents sat on a long couch across from us. There was a big window behind them overlooking their front deck. To the right on the same wall as the window is the front door. Arden and I both sat on recliners facing the parents in this big window. After talking with his parents for a while, I noticed a woman with dark straight hair walk past the window. Her clothes were dark and plain. She could have had on a black sweater with how the sleeves went past her fingertips. She walks left to right past the window. I assume the side profile that I'd seen was Arden's sister, Valina, going to the front door. 
Their door has a large oval, slightly fogged glass panel. It's head level, just enough for me to see her face pressed against the glass. The oval window's light becomes blocked, filled with a truly ghastly grin. Her eyebrows were raised. I could see her prominent features, but the details of her face were too distorted by the fog aesthetic printed on the glass. A few moments go by and she hasn't opened the door, doing my best to be polite and listen to Arden's mom tell me stories about him. I keep shooting glances over, trying to figure out if she needs help with the door or if she was waiting for her boyfriend before coming in. The face that she was making in the window was really giving me the creeps, so I kept my glances to a minimum. But the front door never opened, and nobody else walked across the deck to join her. I sneak another quick look at the front door, and I see a dirty black handprint smeared down the center panel where the face was. There's no longer anything visibly blocking the oval, and lights are once again glowing through the fogged glass. Nobody acknowledged the woman at the door, and she never came in. She also never left the deck, as there was only one way down onto the driveway from the porch, which involved passing by the living room window. And I can confidently say that I did not see the woman walk back across, as I was directly facing it. The large window stretched a couch length. I couldn't have missed it. But hours would go by without anyone new entering the house. Enough time that I'd eventually forget about the woman. Until we'd all hear footsteps on the two wooden steps leading up to the porch. Then, passing by the window, was a teen with blue hair, styled in bright clothing, picked straight from a Hot Topic bargain bin, followed in tow by a boy her age in the same fashion named Cole. I didn't know Valina was so much younger than Arden. The kids were nice, and I ate too many plates when dinner finally came. No idea who or what I saw that day outside the window, but it sure wasn't Arden's sister. This happened when I was in university. My university wasn't in the same town or state that I lived in, so I couldn't commute. I wasn't exactly rich either, so I began the difficult hunt for a cheap apartment. I went to view an apartment, which was in my price range, and I was really hoping to get it because I couldn't find anything else quite as cheap as that apartment, especially in the area. I felt like I was on to a winner. I was a little apprehensive, but it was the only place I could afford. When I was shown the apartment, it was described as pretty old and dingy. Not amazing, but not terrible. One thing I noticed that was strange was that the bathroom door seemed new. Its paint wasn't as faded as the rest of the paint in the apartment. I asked the landlord about it, and he said that they had to change the door because sometimes it got stuck and wouldn't open. Fair enough, I thought. The first three months flew by without issue, and I was enjoying my own space. That all ended one night when I woke up in the dead of night to hear a scratching sound. I went to go and check for the cause of that sound. I turned on the light and got out of bed and suddenly the scratching stopped. That spooked me a bit, but since it stopped and I was tired, I just ignored it, turned out the light and went back to bed. The next day I was watching TV in the afternoon and I heard the scratching again. I pressed the mute button and waited. There was the scratching again. I stomped on the floor, and the scratching stopped. It sounded like it could be cockroaches or some sort of bug. Thinking back on it, I realized how wrong I was. It was a very strange sound. I heard those noises every day from then on. It was never at the same time. The scratching came in random intervals. I started to spend more and more time out of my apartment because of this. I guessed that those noises were probably still occurring, even when no one was home. One night when I was in the apartment, the noise was so awful it really got to me. It woke me up in the middle of the night. Another sound began to accompany the scratching sound. It was a gurgling. Whatever was making it seemed to be either frightened or stressed. I got out of bed and began to search for the cause of those creepy noises. 
Something deep down told me to leave it and go in search of it in the morning. I was now a bit freaked out by it. When morning came the next day, I got up as usual and started watching TV. I was a hard-working student, as you can tell. I was still thinking at this point that I had an infestation in the apartment. I heard the noises and I shot to my feet. It was coming from the bathroom. It was like something was scratching at the bathroom door. I banged on the door hoping it would stop it, like the stomp had stopped it before. But this time I was wrong. I knocked on the door and then the scratching changed to a scuffling kind of tapping. I smacked my palm on the door and it didn't stop. The tapping continued. I didn't like it at all. The tapping grew louder to a banging sound. The thudding on the inside of the door was making the door swell with impact and vibrating through the floor. I knew that it wasn't any infestation. I knew that there was no one on the other side of that door, too. Usually there was no one in the apartment building during the day except for me and the landlord. I stood there, frozen. I was worried that the landlord was going to come up to my apartment, shout at me for the noise, and then suddenly, abruptly, it stopped. I had to check. I didn't want to, but I needed to know if something was in there. I opened the door as slowly as I could. I was bracing myself for whatever was going to happen next. I saw long scratches and dents on the other side of the door. I was really scared and I couldn't stand being alone in my apartment, so I headed down to the landlord's apartment, and when he answered the door, I blurted out what had just happened. He didn't seem that phased. And then, the reason for that was revealed. It was as if he had heard my story time and time again. He followed me upstairs so I could show him the scratches. He sighed, and then told me about a former resident. According to the landlord, there was a woman who tried to take her own life by using a poisonous gas in the bathroom. Apparently, during her attempt, she changed her mind and tried to get out of the bathroom. Like the landlord explained at the start of the story, the old bathroom door sometimes didn't open, and it got stuck. She couldn't get out. The police's suspicion is that the young woman began to kick and bang with her fists against the door to try to get the attention of anyone nearby. Sadly, she was unable to escape, and even if someone happened by, they wouldn't have been able to get inside because her front door was locked. In her final moments, however long or short they were, she must have dropped to her knees and fell forward onto her stomach. She scratched at the door, leaving marks like the ones I saw that day. The sound that I had been hearing was maybe the sound of her scratching. The landlord then said, Look, I have a lot of tenants in here, and I tell them the same thing when they realize that an accident happened in here. I probably should have told you. Hey, sorry. Look, the thing is, if you hear the scratching, and you show her that you noticed it and that you're aware of it, she always stops. Same with the banging. I can paint over the scratch marks if you want. No charge. How about that? I was so angry. He should have told me before I moved in. This wasn't a joke to me. I told him that I was out of there. I went upstairs to get my things. I threw as much as I could into a suitcase and I burst into the streets. I'm now completely free from all mysterious phenomenon. But I often think about the poor woman and the noises I heard in that apartment. My parents took me to visit my aunt in Tennessee for the holidays, and her house was super haunted. It was built in the 1920s, and she still has stuff left from the previous owners. It had belonged to an elderly couple, but the wife had died three months after her husband, both in the same home and no relatives ever claimed any of their possessions. The property sat empty for several years before a family purchased it in the 60s, and they had a son that would one day marry my aunt. Unfortunately, Uncle Terry passed away after a long battle of cancer in 2015, also in the house, and Nina has lived there alone ever since. 
I've always been a believer, so it was extra hard to stay there since I already have trouble sleeping in unfamiliar places. But I'm 16, and I didn't have a choice. We were only staying for three nights, so I probably sound like a petulant child. But this was the longest three days of my life. The house has a really weird layout that I probably can't describe without a floor plan. But everyone else was on one end while I was on the other, and they had two bathrooms closer to them than the one by me. There was no reason for them to come anywhere near my room during the night, yet I woke up to a shadowy figure standing in the doorway even though I'd closed the door before bed. I tried to scream, but no sound came out. I've never shaken so badly as when I tried unlocking my phone. But when I got the flashlight on, the figure was gone. It was so cold that I could see my breath. I thought the heater went out, but I was too afraid to check. I kept imagining a hand shooting out from under the bed to grab my ankle, and I just couldn't move. When morning finally came, I went to breakfast looking as tired as I felt. I told my family everything that happened. It was the most terrifying moment of my life, and they laughed. They thought it was cute. Nina said the ghosts make it cold, but they're harmless, and I should ignore them. I don't understand how someone just ignores a shadowy menace figure watching them sleep. But I could see they didn't care. On the second night, I was watching Netflix in my room when I realized how late it was getting. I hadn't brushed my teeth or gotten any water yet, and I didn't want to be moving through that dark house after everyone else was asleep. When I made it to the bathroom, the downstairs light was still on, but everything was pitch black when I came out. I wanted to skip the water, but my throat went bone dry just because it knew I didn't want to go downstairs. My aunt's tap water is a dirty brown color, so drinking from the faucet was out of the question. Finally, I choked down my fear and ran straight for the stairs where just enough moonlight streamed through the windows to reveal a hunched shadow figure standing at the top of the stairs. I barely kept from screaming, but a soft gasp escaped as a burst of cold air rushed past me. I guess it heard me because its head whipped around and the figure rushed towards me. It felt like being punched in the gut, and I ended up shivering on the floor for several minutes. Water completely forgotten, I ended up crawling most of the way back to my room. It was another long, mostly sleepless night. But I got through it knowing I only had one more. This time I kept the encounter to myself, but my parents said that the TV in their room turned off and on throughout the night. They found the ghost shenanigans far less funny when it interrupted their sleep, but I kept my mouth shut. My aunt said that one day she came home to find every chair in the dining room knocked over, and the lights were randomly flickering. Yet she told the story like she was sharing a funny antidote. If I hadn't witnessed so many things firsthand, I would have assumed she was going senile because some were just that extreme. But something is clearly in that house, and despite what she wants to believe, it's not friendly. I only had one other encounter with it, and it almost broke my neck. I got through the entire last night without incident, and I was so excited to be leaving the next day. All that morning, I was packing stuff up, loading it into the car to hurry us on our way. I know that makes it sound like I was being careless and tripped, but I wasn't. I slowed down on the stairs, knowing full well we'd be staying longer if I broke my leg. Yet, while I was carrying my mom's bag downstairs, a cold hand of steel swiped my ankle, and I tumbled down the last four or five steps, damn near breaking more than my leg. At least that was one incident nobody laughed at. My aunt said, They rarely try to hurt anyone, and speculated I must have made it angry. Regardless of the hows and whys, I was just grateful to have that house in the rearview mirror. I love my aunt, but if I never see that place again, it'll be too soon. So yeah, that's my scariest experience with ghosts. This happened around 20 years ago. After dropping out of high school, I was working a few part-time jobs, 
They were pretty much consuming every day of my life. The school I attended was one of those super high-pressure ones, where everyone's parents are forcing their kids to study all of the time so they can graduate and get into all the best universities. All of my friends were studying just as much as I was working, so I guess that's why all my friendships from school dwindled away. Maybe they didn't want to hang out with a dropout, or maybe that's what their parents didn't want. The only friends I had were the ones I made at work, most of these friends were on average about two years older than me. One night, one of these friends mentioned a place in the next city over, which was supposed to be haunted. It was a hotel. He was talking up the idea of all of us going and checking it out. The story goes, the hotel was abandoned during construction due to financial reasons. The hotel was close to being fully built and they just left it. It has been rumored that it is a local hangout for troublemakers and gangs. The rumor goes that there was a kind of lynching in the unused hotel. A woman was beaten and subsequently killed. There's also a rumor of a suicide on the roof. Again, another female. We all planned to go and see if we could see anything creepy there that night. So I had dinner and waited for my older friends to come and pick me up. We decided to go in the dead of night because, one, it would be a bit spookier, and two, hopefully we would be harder to spot by the police or curtain-twitching neighbors in the dark. The hotel was located just off a national highway, and thanks to the street lights and the lights off the passing cars, we could see pretty well. It seemed like a completely normal hotel, and I was a little disappointed, yet somewhat relieved. We snuck in through a broken window and headed to the rooftop. It was then that we learned even though the hotel looked fully constructed from the outside, there wasn't very much of anything on the inside. It was just bare concrete in there. There was no sense of life. It didn't look like it was part of reality, almost. Like the back rooms, I guess. I still wasn't the least bit scared at this point. None of us four claimed to have the second sight either. We couldn't sense the presence of the paranormal at all, and we didn't have any idea what we were supposed to be looking for either. I mean, should we have tried to do a seance, or a kokori-san, or something? We didn't know. So we looked around on the roof for a while and found a few things. Clearly, someone had had a little picnic party up there. And there were signs of something else they might have been up to up there. If you know what I mean, finding this stuff caused us to kind of forget where we were and relax a little. We began to get a bit louder and a bit more comfortable. We brought alcohol, so we had a drink on the roof, looking out at the lake behind the hotel. It was pretty sweet. We messed around drinking for about two hours or so, and then we got bored and decided to go check out the hotel. I guess the booze had given us a little more confidence. When we got to the ground floor, we realized that there was a basement that we hadn't seen on the first look around. I was quite surprised that we missed it. It was almost as if it had suddenly appeared. There was now a bit of an atmosphere in the empty building. We all agreed that something felt different, something we couldn't put our finger on. One of my friends then decided that he would be the first to say, let's go down there. So we began our descent into the basement. We went pretty slowly. It was incredibly dark down there. It was narrow, and there were puddles of water down there. Even though it was summer, it felt downright freezing in the basement. It wasn't like any of the other rooms in the hotel. We were solely reliant on the light from the flashlights we had. We approached a door at the end of the passageway. And then I felt a chill, the likes of which I haven't felt before or since, on my back. It was as if this icy chill went straight through me. I still remember it as I typed these words. It was like a current of electricity passed through my body. I felt some kind of convulsion which started at the base of my spine and then ran up to my shoulders. As this happened, one of my friends uttered a sharp yelp of horror. I was about to say to everyone, let's get out of here, but I found that I couldn't speak. Like I said, there were four of us, and I was at the front with a friend, and it was one of the two in the back who made that yelp. 
I turned to see him running at full speed back towards the stairs. He was screaming the most maddening scream. It echoed around the narrow passage. It was truly disturbing. I looked at my friend at the front, who was the oldest, and I guess the most confident and strongest of our little group. Even he couldn't keep his composure, and when he started running back toward the stairs, I made sure I was right next to him. We didn't stop until we got back to where we had parked the car. When we got back to the car, the friend who ran first was still clearly upset and frightened by something. It was really weird to see someone older than you at that age literally shake with fear. When he calmed down a little, we asked him about what had happened, and he said that he saw something. He said that he saw the face of a woman right at the back of the hallway when he turned around. She was on the right side of the stairs that we had climbed down in the place where we didn't shine our flashlights the first time we came down. He said that her face was expressionless and blank, but he saw others, a man, and another woman. He said that there could have been five or six faces. It was like they came right out of the shadows. He said his fight-or-flight instinct kicked in, and he just bolted. Something deep down told him to get out as soon as possible. They quickly left the place because even though we didn't see what he did, I'm certain that we all experienced that same chill. I am convinced that we weren't alone down there. We went to an all-night restaurant and stayed up until the sun came up, and then we all went home. Nothing really changed for me after I went to that hotel. People kept on saying it was haunted and... Some say there's a basement, while others vehemently claim there is no basement. I never went back to find out, so I can't tell you. All I know is I was in that basement. I moved to a bigger city after a few years and lost touch with the friends I made at work. I did bump into the sister of a friend who saw the faces in the basement and I asked about him. Sadly, he took his own life in the lake by the hotel he left no note. I often think about that guy and that hotel sometimes by choice and other times not. My grandparents basically raised me, so growing up between the ages of four through nine, I spent a majority of my childhood living with them in their home in eastern Washington. It was what I'd call my happy place. But every once in a while, I'd have to spend some time with my mom. I say have to because at this time, she was no fun to be around. She didn't get clean until I was about nine, so things before that were always shaky. My resistance to seeing my mom, though, it wasn't all her. A lot of it had to do with her apartment. It sat in downtown Spokane, and it was a small one. I guess you'd call it a studio. There was really only one door the front door. The bedroom was essentially the living room and the kitchen, but the bathroom, it was across the hallway. You'd have to leave the apartment and step across the way to access it. Each unit shared their bathroom with another one, though this didn't seem to be a problem since most of my mom's buildings seemed empty. The first time I stayed there, I remember being too scared to use the bathroom at night, so I just held it, waited for some light outside. This couldn't last, though. Not if I didn't want to have an accident. One night, squirming in the pull-out bed, I tried to wake my mom up to see if she would go with me. She was unwakeable. She was snoring, and clearly in a deep sleep. After being patient long enough, I had no choice. I tried to make as much noise as possible, in hopes that those noises would wake my mom up. But it didn't work. I'd made it to the front door, and she was still snoring. So I ventured across the hallway, solo. It was only a couple of steps before you were inside the bathroom, but it seemed like miles. My stomach was all sorts of nervous to be standing between two open doors, so I tiptoed my way into the bathroom. With the light switch on the outside, I was able to turn the light off before entering fully, and then I closed the door behind me. I tried to make the whole thing as quick as possible. Everything was going well, but just as I was about to be done, the lights turned off. Sitting in the pitch black, 
I almost shit myself. Which, considering my position, wouldn't have been the worst, but no, I was terrified. Completely frozen in position. Somehow I managed the meekest of sounds. I was attempting to say, someone's in here, but it was hardly a whisper. I tried again, and I was more successful. But the light remained off. I really wasn't sure I was going to ever be able to move. I was scared of the dark as it was, but here, I knew that I was completely alone. Two doors separating me from my mom, who was in a deep sleep slumber. It occurred to me that I was exposed to various strangers the moment I opened that door. Anyone could be out there. Still in the pitch black, I positioned myself to pull up my pants. Now, slightly less exposed, I contemplated what to do next. Instantly, I went for the sink, and before I could even touch the faucet, I was flailing sideways, back towards the toilet, horrified by the image reflected in the mirror. In the darkness, I hadn't expected to see myself, but I saw something. At first, I couldn't distinguish male or female, but the hair was stark white, which matched the skin entirely. The figure wasn't looking at me directly, and even though I saw this image directly in the mirror, it was still too dark to see anything else. I instinctively looked behind me as I jumped to the side. The reflection had to be coming from somewhere, right? I was alone in there. This image remained in the mirror despite me moving away from the mirror. Its gaze held off to the side, not saying anything, not even really doing anything except seemingly floating within the mirror itself. Just a disembodied head of pure white. Only there were features. I could tell that whatever this was, at one time, it was a human, or it wanted me to perceive it as such. I started to feel a sense of dread. Before, I'd been scared, and then curious, and now I just knew I needed to get out of that bathroom. As I made my way to the door, avoiding the sink this time, I kept my eyes on the old white head staring to the side. But then, it looked directly at me, blackness where its eyes should have been. I don't remember if I screamed out loud, but I stopped looking at the mirror to focus on the doorknob. I couldn't see it, but I knew it was there. It was one of those pop locks. Just turn the knob from the inside and it unlocked itself. Only, that wasn't working. All I could think was that someone had to be holding the door or something. The strength I was using was everything I had. The door should have at least budged. Panic ensued, and by this time, I was crying, trying everything that I could now just to be heard. Couldn't someone just please open this door? Then, the lights flickered for a moment, but total darkness again. If heart attacks are possible at seven years old, I was sure I was about to have one. But then, as I was hanging backwards with all of my body weight, holding the doorknob with both hands, feet against the wall for support, the door suddenly opened, and I fell backwards, hitting my head. The next thing I remember, I'm laying on the bathroom floor, fluorescent lights above my head, and as I sit up, I can see the door is wide open. I make a run for my mom's front door and thank the literal God above himself that it wasn't locked. I didn't need any other obstacles. I wasn't like a religious kid or anything, but I prayed that night. Instead of sleeping, I just literally prayed that I never experienced that again. I prayed that whatever that experience was, that I was safe, that my mom was safe, that God would protect us. I was making deals with God all night, basically, promising to never be bad, always tell the truth, join the Peace Corps. I'm sure that I didn't really have a clue what it was and that I actually called it Corps for the longest time, but clueless as I was, I just needed whoever was in charge to know that I seriously never wanted to experience that again. And I never did. My mom only lived there for that year, and I only saw her a handful of times. Her next place was arguably worse, looks-wise, in the area. It was horrifying for its own reasons, but at least it wasn't someone living inside of her mirror kind of horrifying. 
I still have no idea. Ghost, demon, what was that thing? There is an old mining road past Granite Falls, Washington. One that people say is haunted. The mine itself, I'm sure, is too. Personally, I don't know how I feel about ghosts. I believe in them. I've seen them. And I've never been one to see something and live in denial about what I've seen. No matter how unreal it may be. Especially to an outsider. You ever try to tell someone about your genuine experience and they unintentionally make you feel insane? Well, it happens. One time too many, so now I reserve my stories for people who at least have a desire to hear them. A skeptic is a lot more open-minded than a non-believer, that's for sure. Anyway, saying I don't know how I feel about them, I just... What are they, exactly? Like the man I've seen on this road. He's a disappearing act. Several people I know have reported seeing the same man or apparition of a man that I have just past Silverton right where Perry Creek sits. He's always walking in the same direction the cars are driving, always going east, meaning you never get to see his face. It's odd to see someone walking that way, but not really. The only reason to go out there would be to go into the woods, or if you have property out there. I don't, but my buddy does. It's not uncommon that we just paintball on his property or take the four-wheelers out. We do that a lot. But every once in a while, for the past six years, I've seen this guy walking. At first I thought, okay, a hiker, or a tweaker, but no. He was dressed in some seriously old-looking clothes. He wore a floppy-style hat that I can't even place. Suspenders and boots, and brown, worn-to-shit pants. I had to know what this guy's face looked like. Was he 25 or 85, you know? I instantly crank my head out the window to catch a glimpse of this guy, but as I do, he's just gone. He was nowhere, but there was nowhere for him to go. I tell my buddy, and he says, just wait, but I'll see him again. I asked him, who is this guy? He said, he's exactly what you think he is, dude. He's a ghost, as in not real or not alive. He then tells me some stories about Lime Kiln Trail. That it's got an old abandoned mining town community still in it. Buildings still up and everything, just abandoned. People explore this place, and it's a literal ghost town, I guess. He said the whole woods are said to be haunted. The very woods that we ride around in all the time. Mm, I don't know. Maybe. But if so, I've never seen anything outside of this man on the road. But I'll give it to him. My buddy was right, and I've seen this dude a handful of times. He obviously had too, but it's more than that. It's like people all over know about this place, and I'm just learning about it. I don't fuck with caves or mines, so I won't be going there to find out if it's haunted or whatever. But I will say, the man on the road, he's a ghost. Each time was the same experience, almost. You'd pass him, and even if you didn't take your eyes off the man, he was gone the moment you actually passed him. One time I tried to drive slowly to see if I could holler at a ghost. Maybe they need a ride or something too, you know? He didn't react when I called out, but I slowly just kind of drove behind him. That's probably the time that I got the best look at his clothes. But regardless how long I drove like that behind him, he didn't react or behave any differently. Didn't respond to my calls, and eventually I just had to pass the guy. And of course when I did, he disappeared. I think the scariest time was the last time, which was at night. I had never really seen him during the night, maybe towards sunset, but I almost missed him entirely, which is what scared me so bad. The road is not one that you want to be walking down regardless, but at night, it's just idiotic. There's no streetlights, it's not heavily inhabited, and people like me drive fast down this road. I got to Perry Creek and wasn't thinking about the ghost at all until something jetted in front of my truck, so quick that by the time I hit the brakes, it felt like it happened minutes ago, not seconds. I started driving slowly, looking around for just about anything, and I saw the man. Caught him at the edge of my headlights. He was back on the normal side of the road, headed in the same direction he always was. I don't know what came over me, but I remember actually yelling out my window, "'You need to be more careful!' Yeah, I had a good laugh about that one, too. 
Couple of things, though, I still can't quite figure out. Why do I only see the sky when I'm heading east, but not west? Like, why is it that no one has yet to see his face? It's almost as though he's on a loop, and I just can't wrap my head around what all that means. Hi, I'm Laura. I'm 25 and currently going through a divorce. I moved in with my sickly grandmother roughly two months ago. She doesn't need full-time care, so mostly I just handle the housework and keep her prescriptions straight. She's lived in this same house for my entire life and tells everyone it's haunted. But we thought Nana was just being Nana. She's always been superstitious, but no, it's haunted all right. But before I start with the strange experiences, there's a few things to know. First, the house was built in the 50s, but it has only had two previous owners and there's no records of any deaths occurring on the property, natural or otherwise. Second, it's a small two-bedroom, two-bathroom house and the walls are pretty thin, so we can hear everything. And finally, upon moving in, Nana advised me to cover the mirror in my room because it's the source of the haunting, according to her. Also, the mirror is part of an extremely large dresser that sits against the same wall as the door. It's made of real wood and takes a lot of people to move it. Okay, now we can start for real. Thanks to my diary, I started keeping track of the activity before I knew there was anything to keep track of. I'd had trouble sleeping the first couple of nights, but I'm having a really difficult time with the divorce. Of course, it was hard to sleep. On the third night... I kept hearing Nana get up to go to the restroom at least a dozen times. Footsteps walked across her room, down the hall, and into the bathroom. Then, after a short pause, they would return to her room. I assumed that she wasn't flushing the toilet as to not wake me. The next morning, I asked if she was feeling okay, or if there was anything special I could pick up on the way home from work. When she asked why, I explained and she said that she didn't get out of bed once the entire night, that I probably heard, in her words, the man in the mirror. I was late for work, and I thought that she must be embarrassed, so I didn't press the issue. I did, however, begin sleeping with headphones. Two days later, I woke up and, still groggy, walked past the dresser and caught a glimpse of a dark shadow standing on my bed. I screamed, turning to see nothing but an empty room. When I looked back at the mirror, it was normal again, too. Since I was physically rubbing the sleep out of my eyes when I saw it, I chalked it up to Nana's stories getting to me. I've also had a few reoccurring dreams where a man calls to me from inside the mirror, but I don't want to officially include those among my possible encounters since they could easily be my imagination. However, for the record... I've never had nightmares like this before moving here. Things were quiet for over a week after the first Shadow Man incident. I had pretty much forgotten about the whole thing, but then it happened again. I was standing directly in front of the mirror, putting on my makeup, and I glanced down just long enough to make sure I got the right eyeshadow. Ladies, I know you know what I mean. That quick flash down and then right back up while you're leaning towards the mirror. I did that, and when I looked back up, there was a blurry oval shape, very head-like, hovering right behind my shoulder. I only saw it for a brief instant before screaming and turning, but it wasn't a fully formed shadow figure like before. This was more like strands of black fog trying to solidify into the shape of a head, but falling short. When I calmed down, I finally had a serious talk with Nana about the mirror, before I had immediately dismissed her stories without really hearing them. But now, I was ready to listen. When Nana and Grandpa moved in, the house was empty except for that dresser and the attached mirror. Being such a bulky item, they assumed the previous owners didn't have a way to move it and left it empty for over a month, just in case they came back. It really is a beautiful set. This was after Mom and her two brothers were grown, so it was just Nana and Grandpa living there. A few months later was Thanksgiving, and they decided to move the dresser into their room. 
It took Grandpa, both of my uncles, and my dad just to slide it across the hallway. And they even told Nana, I hope you like it because that baby is in there forever. Little did they know. They began hearing noises soon after. On multiple occasions, Grandpa got out of bed with his gun because he thought someone had gotten inside. But he never found anyone. Eventually, Nana saw a shadow figure crouched in the corner of the room, but when she turned around, no one was there. She saw it on two other occasions as well. Once when it was standing a few feet behind her, and once when it was sitting on her bed. Grandpa never saw it, but he witnessed the whole mirror shaking by itself while getting dressed one morning. By Christmas, they had seen enough and wanted it gone. Dad and my uncles were none too pleased with the development, but seeing how upset my grandparents were, they agreed to move it back into the guest bedroom. Only that wasn't good enough. They wanted it out of the house entirely. Unfortunately, they had barely been able to get potholders beneath the legs to slide it between adjacent rooms the first time. To get it outside, they would have had to pivot around multiple corners. Nana was so upset that one of my uncles measured just to confirm it wasn't physically possible. They would have had to take it apart and cut the frame to get rid of it. Even if they'd had the time, they didn't have the right tools. My uncles promised to do it after New Year's, but life got easier once the mirror was out of my grandparents' room, so it just never got done. They kept it covered with a blanket and would hear the occasional noise, but for the most part, they stayed out of that room and forgot about it. I'm the only other person who has actually lived in the same room with that thing, and now I also keep a blanket over it. Again, there was more than a week where nothing happened, but... Just as I let my guard down, I woke up to the sound of my music suddenly being turned all the way up during a particularly loud part. My headphones had done a perfect job of blocking out any nighttime noises up until that point, but I didn't want to sleep with them after that. Since then, I've woken up to the sound of a man crying, and I tried to record it, but the second I got my camera open, everything went silent. That was the last thing I've experienced so far, but... I'm sure there will be more. I have no clue what this mirror's history could be or how to find out. I just know that I'm getting pretty close to buying a handsaw and dismantling this thing myself. As it turns out, my mom, dad, and cousin each have a story that takes place on the same patch of road in Mexico. I'll tell them as they were relayed to me individually. My parents actually met here in the United States, but they grew up in neighboring pueblos in Mexico. Connecting the two pueblos is a long, empty span of road, maybe five miles long, which is apparently haunted. These stories take place many years apart, but the exact same patch of road. The first story, my father's horse is distressed. When my dad was a young man, he loved horses, jarapos, and drinking, while he has since put down the bottle, he still loves horses and yerpos. Back in the day, he would occasionally ride his horse out across the road to the neighboring pueblos to hang out or hit up some parties. One early morning, he was returning home on horseback from a party in the neighboring pueblo. He was a bit drunk and was casually making his way home when suddenly the air grew still and the night went silent. He said something just felt off and his horse could sense it as well. My dad says that you can always tell what a horse is focusing on by looking at their ears, and in this case, my dad's horse's ears were perked up stiff and focusing at the empty field beside them. Thinking that there might be some sort of animal stalking them, my dad looked around, but the fields beside them were empty, and there weren't any bushes or things for an animal to hide behind. Suddenly, the air went cold and my dad felt goosebumps on the back of his neck, almost as if something was right behind him. That's when my dad's horse couldn't take it anymore and took off running for its life. My dad held on tightly and tried several times to bring the horse to a stop, but it was dead set on getting the hell away from whatever they had just encountered. Eventually, they finally reached their pueblo, and the horse calmed down and came to a stop. Never before or after had the horse behaved that way, 
This left my dad shook up. Needless to say, he was sober by the time he reached home. This next one, my cousin's passenger. My cousin is a few years older than me, so this story takes place many years after my dad's. One late night, my cousin was driving my uncle's pickup truck. He didn't make any mention of where he was heading or in which direction, but he said he was making his way across the same stretch of road. He said that he was driving along and all seemed very calm when suddenly he felt a presence in the vehicle. This pickup truck is one of those older two-door pickup trucks, which have a single long bench-style seat for the driver and passenger. My cousin says he felt the passenger side of the seat sink in, as if someone suddenly took a seat beside him. He said that experience scared him stiff and had him so shook up that he was cold sweating and crying. He was thinking that might be the moment he was going to die. Instinctually, he dared not turn around to face whatever it was sitting beside him, but the presence was so real and he could even make out some sort of silhouette there beside him through his peripheral vision. After a couple miles of panic and sobbing, he eventually reached the neighboring Pueblo and the presence gradually faded away. He made it home safe, but the experience has scarred him. Now for the last one. My mom and cousin spot a hitchhiker. This last one is short, and it actually took place a couple of years ago. This happened to my cousin from the previous story and my mom. A couple of years ago, my mom went to Mexico to hang with family. Her return flight home was in the early morning, so my aunt had my cousin drive her to the airport. Along the way, on that same patch of road, they spotted a man hitchhiking on the side of the road. This was a very strange sight, as not many people hitchhike along that road. Much less early in the morning, before the sun's even out. As you might deduce from the last couple of stories, land around the road is largely empty. There's not really any good reason to be out there at that time. Jokingly, my cousin suggested that they pick him up. They nervously laughed it off in the car and drove past the man. As they continued along, however, they swore they could hear someone whistling at them from out in the empty fields. This made them very nervous, and they wondered if the man, whatever he was, was following them. Eventually, they reached the neighboring Pueblo, where they also swore they spotted him standing just outside the entrance. After college, for several years, my friends and I would get together the day before Thanksgiving. We would eat food, play games, and get super drunk. Maybe you've heard of this tradition. We referred to it fondly as Friendsgiving. And when I was about 25, we celebrated our final one together as a group. And let's just say it was one to remember. Two friends of ours had bought property out in Deer Park, Washington, a couple of months before the holidays, and they invited us to celebrate Friendsgiving out there as a sort of housewarming party, too. We all lived in eastern Washington at the time, so we opted to just carpool there, four of us in one car. It should have been a quick trip, one that we were even somewhat familiar with to a certain point. It was a Tuesday night, and the final road to our friend's house was a long stretch of nothingness. As we started getting closer to what we thought was our destination, we were suddenly aware that we were being followed. I think it was my friend who was driving, Blake, who noticed first and then called it to the attention of the rest of the car. The music was turned down, and suddenly we were all looking out the back window. It wasn't just that there was a car following us on this seemingly desolate road. It was how close they were following us. I remember audibly gasping at that realization, and my friend Summer did the same as we instinctively grabbed each other's hands. The headlights were almost blinding as Blake asked us, Can you see the driver? What's up? I hear my friend in the front seat echo his question. I focused trying to see anything but the blinding headlights. It seemed as though we should be able to make out the driver, but from this angle he resembled nothing more than a large, dark silhouette. I was taken aback by the headlights once again. They were so unusual, and I recall thinking that I'd never seen headlights quite like that. But I realized I sure had, on really old cars. They were perfectly round and slightly raised from the car itself, 
Just as I thought I'd state these facts out loud, it got even closer. You just need to let them pass, pull over, or speed up. Summer ordered Blake from the back seat next to me. Pretty soon, Blake was having to drive so fast to avoid the car tailing us that he couldn't safely pull off the road. I could see the car clearly now. It was a very old, antique-style car. I don't know enough about cars to do much, but I know enough to know that that car was a classic. Who drives a classic car so recklessly, I remember asking out loud. No answer from within. By now, the car became filled with fear and angst. Finally, Blake made the split decision to pull off on a gravel shoulder, which was practically non-existent. The car was still right on our ass as we pulled off. Summer and I were screaming as we realized they were the closest they'd been to our car yet, and we could see that there were multiple silhouettes in the car. We immediately felt a jolt as the car hit our back end. Blake struggled for a moment to regain control of his car. We weren't headed for a cliff or anything, but it was pitch black out there, and we knew that we were surrounded by giant trees. As the car spun, my eyes spun in the direction of the other car. Looking from each window of the car, I could still see the antique vehicle. Until, suddenly, it disappeared. I don't mean that it sped off or anything like that. I mean that we watched it disappear. As he pulled off to the side, we confirmed there was nothing there. It didn't follow us, it didn't pass us or keep driving. It completely disappeared off the road and there was no explaining where the car had gone. Where the hell did they go? Blake asked his passengers, and no one said a thing. I believe we were all in shock, but still, looking at the road behind us, expecting to see something. After a few moments, Blake gets out of the car and looks for any sort of damage to his car. When he got back in, he told us there was no damage, not even a scratch on his car. Still, we were all sure that we had seen someone, a car, following us. Not only that, but we all felt the jolt from the impact. Yet we also agreed that we'd seen something disappear right before our eyes. Either way, Blake started driving back into the road and continued to follow the GPS to our friend's house. We were all sorts of quiet, not sure what to say or think about what had just happened. When we got to our friend's house, we told them about the experience. Them not having been in the car with us, I guess it was just hard for them to believe. I asked them, did any other cars drive down this road, especially in the last ten minutes? No. They were the only occupied property along this road. The rest was either undeveloped or protected land. So, what the hell did we experience? I'm a 37-year-old female from South Dakota, and I've lived in the same house with my family for seven years now. My partner and I are both accountants. We make a decent living, but we also have three kids, so extra money isn't really a thing. Plus our oldest, she's 13, has a heart condition that has required several surgeries during the course of her life. Before moving into our current home, we lived in a small two-bed, one-bath duplex and our neighbors were all the worst cliches. They were constantly fighting, playing loud music, having parties, or, my favorite, locking their dog in the bathroom and letting it bark all night. We already wanted to move. We just couldn't afford the privilege. But then my youngest was born, and our previously cramped space was now absolutely impossible to navigate. We had no choice but to find somewhere else even if that meant moving further away from the city. And to cut an irrelevant part of the story short, our realtor eventually asked if we believed in ghosts. Honestly, no, not even a little. My partner and I were both huge skeptics. Notice I said, were. I went so far as to say something along the lines of, why do you have the perfect three-bedroom, two-bathroom just sitting around the corner, but no one will buy it because of the terrible things that happened inside? I really was only joking, but then his expression morphed into one of nausea and surprise. 
It was actually a four-bedroom, two-and-a-half bath, and it was still 40 miles outside of the city. But it was well within our price range, and that was the kind of luxury worth sacrificing a little drive time for. The house had sat empty for so long that our realtor asked us to wait a few days while he got the utilities turned on. There were a few cosmetic issues, but everything else was in great condition. It passed inspection with flying colors. Everything else, down to the golden plumbing fixtures, was absolutely hideous, but we remodeled bit by bit over the years. Anyway, you're probably wondering what atrocities happened in the house to make it so cheap in the first place. In the 60s, a couple lived here with their grown son, Anthony. Anthony suffered from some kind of mental illness, but no one could be sure which one. Many have said that he was never officially diagnosed, just clearly disturbed, and most agreed that he often experienced paranoid delusions. One Halloween, some other family members stopped by as they were passing through town. They were on a vacation but wanted to take the kids trick-or-treating. It was another couple with two young boys, and they ended up staying the night. At some point, Anthony woke up to the sound of movement downstairs, and thought it was an intruder. He retrieved one of his father's hunting rifles from the gun cabinet and went down to protect the family. The two children had gotten out of bed. Maybe they wanted a glass of water. Maybe they were looking for a restroom. Or maybe they were just kids getting into mischief. Probably the latter. Regardless of the reason, they both perished on the kitchen floor. Anthony and the children's parents rushed downstairs at roughly the same time, and the weapon was fired once more. But thankfully, no one else was injured. Anthony was sent to an asylum where he ended his own life a few years later, but several of the previous owners have claimed to see an apparition fitting his description. A handful of people have lived in the house since, but they all moved out within two or three years until it finally just didn't sell again. It was March when we moved in, and our whole family instantly fell in love. We bonded over decorating our new spaces, and laughed at the fools who missed out on the deal of a lifetime because of silly superstitions. For seven months, nothing remotely out of the ordinary happened, but the second October rolled around. It was like we were thrown into an entirely different universe. Doors suddenly started slamming shut by themselves. Footsteps sounded above our heads when no one was up there, and sometimes, but not as often, we'll hear a little boy crying. When my youngest was smaller, I used to confuse it for him, but now when it happens, I know it's just the ghost. Nothing strange has ever happened outside of October. All year long, our home is like a paradise, but from October 1st through October 31st, it's a pure hell house. Halloween is always the worst, too. I don't know if it's because it's also the anniversary of the children's deaths, or if it's just because it's Halloween. I don't really care to find out anymore, either. My partner and I used to let the kids stay with friends that one night while we toughed it out. But that came to an end three years ago, when I almost broke my leg in the shower. My eyes were closed as I stood beneath the faucet, rinsing off the last of the soap. When I opened them, I saw the shadow of a very large man on the outside of the curtain. I yanked it back so hard that I fell over, nearly snapping my leg the way I landed. The curtain fell with me to reveal an empty bathroom. No one was there. Not really. After collecting myself for a few moments, I finally regained enough control to stand. But as I rushed to leave, I noticed a large handprint on the mirror twice the size of my own, and it looked as if someone had pressed their hand against the glass and dragged it all the way down. I instinctively began wiping it away with my towel, and as my hand raced back and forth, I caught a glimpse of a large, hairy man standing right behind me. His expression was wild and menacing, but just like that, he was gone again. Ever since that incident, We've spent our Halloweens in a hotel. There's also a dozen examples of small things going missing only to turn up in strange places, 
But I figure that's the kind of stuff you guys hear all the time. The volume on the TVs and the music randomly going up and down. And there's been occasions that they shut off entirely. My partner and I haven't had many nightmares. But my youngest had dreamed of playing with two other little boys in our house. Thankfully, the shower thing was by far the worst any of us have experienced. And I'm just grateful it happened with me instead of the kids. But I would love to know... Has anyone else experienced these kinds of anniversary hauntings? Everything is just so normal the rest of the time that it's hard to believe it's the same house. I live in an old house that was built in the 1940s. We've always had weird noises, but that's normal for homes like this even when they don't have five cats. We're also skeptics, so we've never had a reason to think differently until my nephew stayed with us last weekend. Dylan is three, and things got weird within the first couple of hours of his arrival. The living room, kitchen, and dining room are all one big open area, with the TV sitting on an entertainment center that separates the two halves. My husband and I were on the couch sitting directly across from the television, and Dylan was playing with his toys next to my feet. Suddenly, there was a noise in the dining room that sounded like something falling off the counter. It startled him, so I explained that it was just one of the cats. A few minutes later, I noticed that he was still staring at the same spot, and he looked really frightened. I asked if the mean kitties scared him, and he said, No, that man... We have a tall corner shelf at the far end of the dining room, so, thinking that he might be seeing that, I walked over and turned on the light. Then I pointed to the shelf and asked if that's where the man had been. Dylan shook his head and pointed to a counter on the opposite wall instead. I asked if the guy was still there, and he said no, so we let it go. It was his first time staying with us, so we figured he just wasn't used to the new environment. A few hours later, I was reading Dylan a story for bedtime, when he suddenly started crying and pointing at the door. I didn't see anything, but he was too upset to be faking, so I turned on the lights and checked the hallway. When I asked what scared him, he said it was the man again. I did my best to get a description and learned that the guy was old, like Grandad, short and angry. I asked why he seemed angry, and Dylan scrunched his face into a scowl. We took that to mean that he was trying to imitate the man's expression. But I still wasn't sure if this was all one big game or if he really saw someone. I called my sister to see if he had ever done something like this before, and she swore that he's never even had an imaginary friend. She thought that he was playing some kind of game and said not to worry about it. But I think she just wanted me to get off the phone. The next morning, I found Dylan hiding under his blankets. Apparently, the man kept him up most of the night by knocking on the wall and stomping in the hall. Once again, I explained that it was just cats being cats. He's never actually been in a house with pets before, so my husband and I decided that he simply wasn't used to it. The day went on and Dylan's mood improved drastically, especially after putting him down for a nap in our bed. But that evening... We all settled into the living room for another movie, and I caught him staring into the kitchen again. He was shrinking back against the couch like he was trying to pass through it. Hoping to ease his mind before bedtime, I turned on all the lights and said, See? There's nothing. But that's where I stopped, because one of the drawers suddenly slid open by itself. There was no cat anywhere near us and our floors are not so unlevel that drawers randomly slide open. We've lived here for six years, and that has never happened. Thankfully, my husband saw it too, or I would have thought I'd lost my mind. I immediately closed the drawer back, but it slid open again as soon as I walked away. Dylan began crying and wanted to go home. His parents wouldn't return until late the following night, so we let him stay in our bed, and he slept fine. We didn't, but he was fine. Not gonna lie, we were all pretty on edge the next day. My husband and I were both flinching at every noise, even the ones that clearly were caused by the cats. As we got within the final hour of Dylan's stay, 
We were checking my sister's location every few minutes. Just when I really began to think that something else would happen, our bedroom door creaked open several inches, just wide enough for someone to stick their head in. Sure enough, Dylan ran to me crying. The old man was watching us from the bedroom. And he didn't like it. Believe me, none of us liked it. My husband shut the door, and thankfully, it stayed shut. My sister arrived 20 minutes later, and Dylan was ready to go. I'd never seen him move that fast. When I told her everything over the phone that night, she said that he's never afraid when he stayed with her in-laws or our parents, and he hasn't seen anything remotely similar to this on TV. She thinks we have a real ghost, but I don't know what to believe. I can't explain how Dylan saw a man near a drawer that opened by itself. That's the one that really gets me. Various arguments can be made for the rest, but the drawer is something else. It's been a few days since everything happened, and my nephew hasn't seen the man again, so I'll take that as a win unto itself. My husband and I haven't seen anything overtly paranormal either, but we're still jumping at every sound. And there are long periods when we feel as if we're being watched. I know we're probably extra paranoid, too. So that's why we wanted to share our story to see what others think. I should also mention, four of our cats have always behaved in such ways that we would never think anything else was here. But since trying to research this topic, I've read that some believe animals can see things we can't. That being said, most of our cats seem fairly oblivious except for Twitch, and believe me, he earned his name. We found him on the side of the road when he was only a couple of months old, no sign of a mother or siblings, and we brought him home. Since he's gotten here, he'll randomly cower from thin air or attack nothing. You know how cats will belly crawl up to something they aren't sure about and kind of smack it and run away in one motion? He does that a lot, but to nothing. At one point, we were worried enough to take him to our vet, and we said that he was having hallucinations. She agreed it didn't sound normal, but lots of expensive tests later, he got a clean bill of health, and we accepted that he was just a quirky cat. Now, I'm wondering about that again, too. I don't know. I guess that's everything, though. So thanks for listening, and all advice is greatly appreciated. Attached to my old high school was a building with a swimming pool. One summer, my friends and I managed to break in. By break in, I should clarify that during the summer, it was open to the public, and we'd originally been there as guests. But we had the very bright idea that if we hid in the building during closing, we would eventually be left with the pool to ourselves. So that's what we did. We'd swam in the pool a million times, but for some reason, we imagined ourselves having a sort of party in there this time. We ran into a slight problem almost immediately, which was that closing this building down took a lot longer than any of us expected. And we'd spent a good amount of the night just hiding and dodging the janitorial staff. However, the lights eventually all turned off, and finally, we heard the main doors shut and lock. We all creeped out of our hiding places and met outside the pool room. This was a pretty old building in a relatively suburban small town. No cameras or anything like that to worry about. But we also realized we'd be swimming in basically total darkness. We tried for a while to switch the lights on, but we realized they all required a key. They weren't really switches at all. So just when we'd accepted our fate of swimming in total darkness, we realized the pool lights were on. It was pretty much dark everywhere except the pool, and for a while it was fun as hell. One friend, though, Devin, he always has to, like, do more, if you know what I mean. If we were skating, he had to try the craziest tricks or skate the places we weren't supposed to. He was a big fan of stealing his parents' car during the night just because, and he always had to get high. Mind you, we were 14 at this time. So Devin decided that he's going to smoke a joint, but not just smoke a joint. He wants to pull the pool cover over us and hotbox the thing. Basically, I object immediately. 
One, because the thing is super heavy and we just spent like 10 minutes getting it off. But two, because I don't want to hotbox anything. Enough people agree and so Devin and a couple others decide to hotbox the sauna instead. It's in the same structure as the pool and the door faces the deep end. While they go do that, the rest of us decide to do backflips off the diving board, showing off, just bullshitting around. I get kind of tired at some point and just let myself sort of wade in the water, watching my friends continue to do their thing. Then I decide I'll go sit in the hot tub for a while. Swimming in the direction of the ladder, I feel someone grab my leg and pull me back in the direction I just came from. I wasn't expecting it at all and I found myself inhaling a bit of water. It hadn't just pulled me though, something was keeping me underwater. I struggle long enough to start panicking, and when I finally emerge from the water, I'm gasping for air. Naturally, I'm sort of pissed, and I know that I'm about to get someone back really good. But as I look around me, directly around me, I see there's no one around me. Everyone's still either on the other side of the pool, waiting to do flips from the outside, while the rest are still in the sauna. Then, splashing could be heard behind me but I already knew that no one was there. Instead of even looking, I swim as fast as I can to the other side of the pool. When I raced out of the pool, everyone's asking me what the hell's wrong. I didn't say a word, but they wouldn't stop staring, so I just told them flat out, we gotta get out of this pool. That's when our friend James flew out of the sauna. Devin and the rest followed quickly behind him. They all looked thoroughly freaked. James, addressing everyone, says the same thing I'd said only moments before. We gotta get out of this place. For some reason, this time everyone listens. And without any more words, we all grab our stuff and book it towards the back door. As we make our way out of the building anything but gracefully, Devin is hollering about the sauna having a mind of its own, and he's yelling, asking why none of us opened the door for them. Apparently, they'd been banging on the door of the sauna. The rest of us swear we didn't hear anything. My friend Andrew starts telling Devin to calm down, that they probably just got too high in there or something. The rest of the guys from the pool agreed, laughing that the guys got themselves paranoid, but I don't know. I believed them. We finally came to a stop when we'd made it a certain distance away from the pool. James and Devin were dead serious about what they'd seen. They said they hadn't been putting water on the stones, yet the stones kept reacting like someone was splashing water on them, filling the sauna with more and more steam. When it got to be too much, they put the joint out and attempted to open the door. But they couldn't get out. Somehow, the door was locked from the outside or something. I do know that none of us guys outside heard that at all. They recounted the story over and over while the other guys laughed, and I kept thinking about what I had experienced. I really wanted to say something, but the way everyone was reacting to their story, I don't know, I just couldn't do it. We were technically only sophomores at the time, so we still had to experience this place for another three years. It never quite felt the same, but I also never swam there at night again. And I never had anything else try to pull me down or whatever, ever again. Something we did learn our junior year. A student had drowned in that pool in the 80s. They didn't know how to swim, apparently. During class, they ended up drowning while the teacher, who also served as the lifeguard, had stepped away from the pool area. They took their eyes off the pool for less than five minutes. None of the other students had noticed the kid struggling, and unfortunately, he died. Several years ago, I was dating a woman who, when I first met her, I thought, this is a woman who is as enthusiastic about adventure and the outdoors as I am. Granted, the more I got to know her, I realized she was actually much more adventurous than even myself. She had a thing for finding haunted or abandoned locations and exploring them, usually solo. Not to sound sexist, but at the time, this heavily concerned me. Guess it still kind of does. I know that she could take care of herself for the most part, but 
Some of these locations were places that even I wouldn't venture into alone. And some were places that clearly lots of people ventured into, and often. For as many places as we visited and as many things as we did, there was only one time we actually experienced something while together. Something scary. We were visiting the California coast and had found our way to the Queen Mary. For anyone who doesn't know it, the ship is permanently moored along the coast of Long Beach, California. Before we took the tour, I didn't know anything about it, especially that it was known to be haunted. It was an active ship for over 30 years. We learned that during its time as a working ship, it had experienced more than a few tragedies. Though they all seem to be genuine tragedies, like collisions, fires, etc. However, what ultimately took out the ship was rather average. Business wasn't great. After operating at a loss for several years in a row, it was sold, becoming the almost landmark that it is today. So going into this whole thing, I didn't have any preconceived notions. I just learned as I went. We eventually made our way to the engine room. It was an interesting area with lots to stop and look at, but it also had these tight doorways that made me feel uncomfortable. Part of me just felt claustrophobic, which I hate. At one point, my date stops me and says, Okay, listen. At first, I thought she was going to tell me something else, so either way, I waited and listened. But soon I realized that she was telling me to listen to our surroundings. She closed her eyes, so I did the same even though it felt a little weird. I didn't know exactly what I was listening for, but eventually, I was hearing things. Mainly, sounds of a ship, right? Creaks, metal on metal. But there really was more. It felt like the sound of an alarm. Not directly next to us, and not loud. It was distant, for sure. But it didn't really sound like any alarm I'd ever heard. It sounded kind of old. I opened my eyes and my date was looking at me. She asked, So, did you hear it? And before I could ask her if she meant the alarm, I felt an immense cold take over my whole body, just for a brief instant, but it was to the bone. It was as if someone or something had passed directly through me. I felt sick, like maybe I was about to puke. The thought of puking during a public tour was humiliating enough but then I started to feel dizzy. So not only was I going to puke, now I was going to pass out, too. I imagined myself passing out into my own puke, and there was just no way. I tried to continue walking in the direction that would lead us out of the engine room. For a minute, I was sure I was pulling it off, but my date thought otherwise. She stopped me, asking if I was all right. In the moment that she did, I felt a soaring pain through my chest. I've never felt anything like it. That's what I remember thinking at the time. I also remember thinking it's horrible, but it was brief. What's odd now, though, is that I don't really remember the pain itself. What I recall most is that as soon as the pain ceased, so did everything else. I wasn't nauseous anymore, and the dizziness had subsided. Even my date could see the shift, and she exhaled in relief that I was okay. Then she asked me again, did I hear it? I told her I heard what I thought sounded like an alarm, a weird old alarm, and I watched her expression turn up into a smile. She told me she'd been here before, that she'd seen something there before, a man. He was a young man, sweaty, dressed in overalls. Most unsettling to her was that the man came up from behind her, and it was just after she'd heard what she swore was an old alarm. He was running, and she barely moved out of the way as he passed by, where she watched him disappear while passing through the various doorways. Not gonna lie, I felt very much like leaving after she told me this story, so I continued towards the path to exit. All the while, my date is just hyped up and excited, retelling me of her experience, saying how cold it felt suddenly. I wondered if that same guy hadn't just ran into me inside this place. I know this next part is silly, but I was sort of frustrated, or maybe just felt chilled by my date's choice not to tell me what I was walking into. Something, no idea what, but maybe it's that same thing she saw, but something nonetheless ran into me. 
I've never felt a chill like that. Not before, not since. I don't like to mess with ghosts and such. I mean, honestly, before this, I think I mainly didn't believe in ghosts out of fear. I don't like to think about what it means to be a spirit. How one gets there, how one doesn't. I mean, respect for the dead, for sure. But I'm not eager to communicate with them. If you ever find yourself in Long Beach, maybe give it a visit and decide for yourself. Oh, and you can sleep there. Like rent a room. They're beautiful, but no thank you. Knock yourself out.